Okay, we're now back in public session. Uh, next item on the agenda is scrutiny of EU legislative proposals. Uh, Schedule A has come to uh, 2019, uh, set 48, proposal for regulation of the European Parliament of the Council amending regulation EU number 508 of 2014 as regards certain rules relating to the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund by reason of the withdrawal of the United Kingdom uh, from the Union. And come to uh, 2019 and 49, proposal for regulation of the European Parliament of the Council amending regulation EU 217 of 2403 as regards fishing authorisation for European Union uh, fishing vessels in United Kingdom waters, uh, fishing operations of the United Kingdom fishing vessels in Union waters. It is proposed that, no, that there are no subsidiarity concerns with regards to common to 1948. It is also proposed that the proposal wants further scrutiny. Is that agreed? And it is proposed that common 219 of 49 uh, warrants further scrutiny. Is that agreed? It is proposed to do this by way of inviting the relevant officials to uh, appear before the committee uh, next week, if possible. Is that agreed? Okay. And Schedule B is COM 219-837, uh, the proposal for council decision of a position of, to be taken on behalf of the European Union within the working group on wine set up by the Euro Economic Partnership Agreement between the European Union and Japan as regards the forms to be used for certification of the imports of wine products originating in Japan into the European Union and um, one of the things concerning the self-certification. The proposal the proposals listed in Schedule B warrant no further scrutiny. Is that agreed? Okay. Now we're, we're dealing with our main item then, our business today is the TB eradication program. I'd like to welcome uh, Mr. Simon Moore uh, today before the committee uh, in the sec first section to deal with his Mr. Professor Moore is Director of UCD Science, uh, UCD Centre of Veterinary Epidemiology and Risk Analysis. And before we begin the issue, I want to bring into your attention witnesses are protected by absolute privilege and respective evidence you to give to the committee. However, if directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled to after to qualify privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings be given and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice effect where possible. You should not criticise or make charge against any person or entity by name in such ways to make him or her identifiable. Members are reminded of long term parliamentary practice effect that members should not comment on or criticise may charge against a person outside the House and officially by name or in such ways to make him or her identifiable. Uh, Mr Moore, now I invite you to make your opening statement, please. I know you have already submitted quite a lengthy statement, uh, so if you could summarise as much as possible, and then once you have concluded, members will, will uh, ask them the questions. Uh, Chair, thank you very much, and uh, I can assure you that I will summarise the, the, the statement that I provided. By way of background, I am the director of the UCD Centre for Veterinary Epidemiology and Risk Analysis, and our work is entirely to provide the science to support policy decision making, both by the Department of Agriculture but also Animal Health Ireland in the area of animal health and welfare and also public health. It's a fully funded uh, uh, centre uh, funded by the Department of Agriculture located in the veterinary school at University College Dublin. And I also chair the Scientific Committee of the European Food Safety Authority, where we do very similar work, providing the science to support policy decision-making by the Commission. So, um, I, as I mentioned, I'm just going to glean uh, key components from the, from the presentation, from the notes. Uh, in terms of the program itself, it's very much informed by ongoing research, and our focus has really been on two questions. One is, what are the constraints to eradication? And secondly, what are practical solutions to those constraints? We focus in three areas, uh, cattle, wildlife, and also the overall program, including seeking to glean lessons from international experience. You can see on page three, there's a graph, and that relates to where Ireland is with, in comparison with uh, our colleagues in the four countries uh, sorry, the, the, uh, the, 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 the four countries of the UK. And you can see the green line there. There's been an ongoing fall in incidents over time, uh, but certainly uh, not to the point of eradication. So moving to page four, the fundamental question that I wanted to address, to speak to today is fundamentally, are we doing enough to successfully eradicate TB by 2030? And as you'd remember, the 2030 is the target that's been set by the Department of Agriculture. Prior to the, 
the, the recent introduction of badger vaccination. So prior to that, it, it, it's my view, but it's certainly widely shared, that we essentially did not have the tools to eradicate. So it was very much a control program focused on how can we ensure that TB remains at low levels while we uh, identify and address the constraints to eradication. So essentially we did not have a, I guess you could call it a, a full toolbox of what was required. With badger vaccination now in place and this ongoing rollout, it's certainly an important addition, but it's my view, and there's very robust evidence to support this, that even with all current strategies, plus the new badger vaccination program, that won't be sufficient for us to achieve eradication of TB by 2030. And there's three particular reasons why I state this. The first one is uh, ongoing national research has identified a number of issues that uh, are uh, of ongoing concern, and some of these are technical, but some of them are not. The non-technical include program fatigue, uh, the commercial realities of trying to keep commerce going whilst we're uh, uh, seeking to eradicate, and also limited industry engagement. The second piece of evidence comes from international experience. And uh, there's essentially four countries internationally that have had long-term TB eradication programs, mainly in the presence of wildlife. Um, uh, four, four countries, there's Australia, there's New Zealand, there's Ireland and the UK. Other countries certainly have had problems, but they're the four with, with really serious problems. Two of those countries have made substantial progress. Australia, uh, uh, the last known case of TB was in 2002 in Buffalo, in 2000 in cattle. Uh, New Zealand is also making very substantial progress, and I'd be more than happy to talk in greater detail about that. But, but w the, the key point here is that lessons learnt from those two countries would suggest that there are fundamental differences between uh, key components of the program here versus those where success was really, uh, those that were successful. And I particularly relate to cattle controls and also industry engagement. And the third piece of evidence comes from recent work, work that's recently be finished, been finished. We've been working closely with the University of Wageningen in the Netherlands. And uh, that work was undertaken essentially to assess, or to ask or to answer the question, uh, can we actually eradicate given current controls plus, plus badger vaccination? And central to their work is a concept which, which you may might not be familiar with, but it's important in terms of the argument I want to put forward. It, it's a concept called the reproduction ratio. And in terms of the way that diseases work, the reproduction ratio is the number of secondary cases for every primary. And what that means is there's a threshold. If we can get the reproduction ratio, or R, less than one, we can move towards eradication. If it's more than one, we can't. So it's essentially we consider R equals 1 as this threshold for eradication. And the work that's been done as part of that study, looking solely at current controls without badger vaccination, current controls would suggest that R sits between 1.07 and 1.16. Essentially, we're not eradicating. When we add badger vaccination, we tip below that threshold, but only just. Uh, and uh, the, the, the estimates we've got is 0.93 to 0.97, so just below this threshold for eradication. So that's all current controls plus badger vaccination. But what that means is if we just did that, if we just did current controls plus, plus badger vaccination, because this R is only just below one, we're looking at a time to eradication of 60 to 90 years approximately, a very long time, many decades. And there's a couple of things that, that, that would suggest that, that that figure of just below one, it's probably a little bit optimistic, and two reasons. One is that it's based on nav national averages, and we know in some parts of the country it will be higher and lower, suggesting that in some parts of the country perhaps we're not going to eradicate, in some parts we'll do it a little bit easier. Also, as we shift from, vac from culling to vaccination, we, we will, uh, per se, by default, end up with more badges. And as you end up with more badges and a higher density, that makes it more challenging for vaccine to work. 
So, so the bottom line is, in my view, we're actually at a critical decision point. And I would suggest that we couldn't make any decisions. We weren't at a critical decision point one year ago, five years ago, ten years ago, because we didn't have beds of vaccination on the table. We do now, but because of what we've found, uh, we would suggest that if we're genuinely interested in, in eradicating TB very quickly, 2030 or, or after that, there's a need for us to think very hard about both the scope and also the intensity of control measures. And that's important both in terms of time to eradication and also the cumulative cost of eradication. And if I could just show you page eight, um, figure two. This, this relates to a different program. This relates to BVD. It doesn't relate to TB, but the message is the same. If you have a look at page eight, figure two, what we're seeing here is basically the number of PI animals, the number of PI animals at different points in time. And, and if you have a look at 2013, that was the start of the PI, uh, of the BVD eradication program. If there had been no uh, PI retention at all, and we're aware of, uh, I'm sure people are aware of the issue of PI retention. If there had been no PI retention at all, we would have nationally followed the green line and we would have no BVD in the country now. But in fact, what was happening was we were following the, uh, the yellow line uh, throughout 13 to 16. And if that had continued, you, you can see there that that yellow line never gets to zero. And in fact, we would never have eradicated. And, and what's happening is that we're, we're actually mirroring the purple line. So for the first three years, 13 to 16, there was plenty of, there, there was issues of PR retention that has progressively been addressed. But you can see here that what that means, if we compare the green and the purple line, that's an extra three or four years uh, of, of costs uh, to move to, to eradication. So, so given all of that background, uh, uh, I'm here today to, to really focus on what are the additional measures that we should consider. And this is based on research by our group, but collectively from research from lots of different groups, and I'm seeking to represent the science from all of those groups. And essentially, it's my view that there's three fundamental areas where we need to focus. One is adequately addressing TB risk from, from wildlife, and this is page nine. And uh, the, the badge vaccination program is, is clearly fundamental to this, and I would suggest that most of the work that needs to be done in terms of badge vaccination is all about monitoring. We need to ensure that this works, or if it doesn't work, work we need to know why. And uh, I just highlight the fact that each of those are very active areas of research at the moment. While I'm on wildlife, I'd like to talk about deer because I know that that's an important concern of this committee. Um, so this is part of this component of, of addressing issues of wildlife. And, and, and the issue with deer, it's important for us to understand I believe it's important for us to understand the issue of what, what, what I term an, an epidemiological role. It's the role being played by deer. We know they get infected, there's evidence to show that, but what we need to know is, do they get infected as a spillover? That is, there's infected cattle, infected badgers, and they just happen to pick it up? Or are they, that's a spillover host, or are they a maintenance host where it actually self-sustains in deer populations? Or most worrying, are they a maintenance host with spillback uh, to cattle? And badgers, we know, based on the evidence, that they act as a maintenance host with spillback to cattle. And the question fundamentally is, what's the role being played by deer here? And uh, I, I give some examples from various programs, but I, 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 uh, just for brevity, um, certainly in some countries, deer act as a maintenance host. In Spain, there's evidence. Most, uh, perhaps the most uh, interesting or the most uh, uh, interesting example comes from Michigan, where white-tailed deer are a maintenance host for TB. But that was a man-made problem, because what happened was, we, based on the evidence, they acted as a, 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 a spillover host, so they were just picking up infection from cattle. But um, due to uh, the, the tradition of hunting in that part of the state, uh, in that state, um, hunters were actually leaving large dumps of silage and hay over winter, 
and that was to keep deer numbers up so that there'd be deer to hunt uh, uh, next, uh, next spring. But what they did was, firstly, it, it artificially increased deer numbers, and it also uh, encouraged aggregation. And those two things were very important. And at this point, we now have deer as, as, uh, as more than a spillover host in Michigan. So the story with Ireland is um, data are sparse. And, and the epidemiological role played by wild deer, and I mean particularly seeker and seeker crosses, is, is uncertain. Um, but but the, we have some evidence. The first piece of evidence we have is that certainly there's been an increase in, in, in expansion of area. In terms of density, we don't know, uh, but I understand that there's work currently being done on that. We also know, although this data are sparse, that in most parts of the country, the, the, the prevalence, the percentage of deer that are infected is actually very low, whereas in Wicklow, the numbers are much higher. So my assessment, and, and I think this is shared by the scientists uh, with whom I work, in fact, all the scientists I've spoken to, is that currently in most parts of Ireland, uh, there's no evidence to support the view that deer are a, ma are a maintenance host. But in Wicklow, it's different. In hotspot areas of Wicklow, we don't know. Um, and I read out what I said on the top of page 12. Higher TB prevalence has been observed. However, it does not provide conclusive evidence that TB is self-sustaining in deer populations. And that's the fundamental question. Nor, if it is, what's its relative contribution compared with cattle and with, with, with badgers? And, and I present in this paper um, uh, some thoughts, and I, I've spoken in great detail to a, a colleague in Michigan, I've spoken with colleagues here, I've spoken with colleagues in Australia on a different matter, but in terms of the way forward, th there are possibilities, but it's not easy. In Michigan, the methodologies that we use there are not directly translatable, but certainly in areas of concern, and I would suggest in Wicklow, it is important that deer are managed to ensure that we don't end up with a maintenance host. And that relates to uh, the issue of density, it relates to aggregation. And while we're doing that, when deer are removed, it is important that they're used for, for to, their scientific value is maximised for us to understand what is, the, what is the role being played. And there's a new methodology that's only really come on the scene in the last few years called whole genome sequencing. It's essentially understanding exactly what the genome is. And there's an opportunity for the first time for us to try and understand uh, what we call the direction of spread. We have, for example, cattle and deer infected. Is it the cattle infecting the deer? Is it the deer infecting the cattle? And whole genome sequence offers us that opportunity. And that work is, is just starting here in the Republic. The second area that uh, I, I, I believe is really important, and it's based on international experience, is the issue of additional risk-based cattle controls. And I appreciate this was an area of discussion at, uh, in December. And, and, and what's important is, in countries such as Ireland, it's not possible with current, current technologies for us to guarantee that this herd is free and this herd is, uh, is not. Uh, we, we can if, if we... So we... we What's been used internationally is basically a, a risk-based approach. That is, we cannot guarantee that herds are free. And so we're saying that this is a herd of very low risk versus this is a herd of, of high risk. And, and it was highlighted last time when you met in December that herds could be at risk for up to 10 years. And that's possible, but it depends on risk factors involved. And there's two main drivers for this persistent risk. One is infection in the locality, and two is infection in the herd. And it's the latter that I'd like to particularly focus on, and it's due to residual infection. Infection that's present in animals, but they're not detected using current tests. And, 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 and essentially, there's, there's a number of studies that have shown that this is a, a significant problem, that uh, essentially animals, what we call residually infected animals, animals infected, but they're not testing positive. And work, for example, from Cambridge, work that we've done, but also work from Cambridge, would suggest, based on modelling studies, that between 10 and 25 per cent of herds at release still have infected animals present. And we would... 
sorry. So what percentage did you just say that? T 10 to 25 per cent based on work from Cambridge, and that was based on GB data. The work we've done here uh, would suggest that uh, we haven't done similar work, but what we have done has shown that, that herds definitely are at increasing risk for an extended period of time. And we've been able to disentangle, not completely, but to some extent, that residual infection is a very important part of that. So we have this issue of residual infection. We also, if you look on page 15, work we've just recently done has essentially sought to uh, create a picture of the level of movement of cattle in Ireland as part of ongoing commerce. And the data is instructive, uh, indicating, for example, that movements, movement events, so this is trailers, this is not animals. The number of, uh, the, of, of trailers could have one animal, it could have 10, could have 100. Um, if we were in 2016, there were 1.3 movement events and the distance travelled by those, uh, those vehicles was, was, was enormous. But, but that's beside the point. What's important, if, if I come to the conclusion on paragraph 37 on page 15, is that we have this ongoing churn or ongoing recycling of infection where we're, we're not clearing all infection from herds at the point of de-restriction. We have substantial movement of, of, uh, of cattle. And given that, um, and uh, I, I, sorry, I go back a step, and there's two, there's two issues in terms of the fact that herds are being released and we still have infected cattle. One is technical and one is legislative. Technically, um, we do not have the tools that will uh, provide us with 100% guarantees of freedom. We don't. And human doctors don't either in terms of... Um... Secondly, the legislation at the moment in the EU and the relevant legislation is... Council Directive 64432, as you folks are aware, herds, as soon as they've had two clear tests, they're free to trade, free to trade. Um, but, but, but in fact, in fact um, uh, that, that isn't sufficient to mitigate risk. And to give you as a comparison from my home country of Australia, um, the program there, um, for herds to move from point of de-restriction after infection, here it's four months, there it was eight years. So huge differences. But, but, and uh, 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 how, how, how do we reconcile that? How do we reconcile that with ongoing commerce? O ongoing commerce and the, the methodology that, in fact, the only methodology available internationally to cope with one on the one hand, uh, this problem of residual infection and ongoing movement, and the other hand, ongoing commerce, which of course has to keep going, is this concept of a risk-based approach. And that is that herds move progressively from high risk to low risk, and there's the opportunity for time for us to gain increasing confidence that they're free. And of course that happens while there's ongoing testing. But we have a problem, and the problem is that, that uh, while we're doing that, we also need to be careful not to put other herds at risk. And so the approach that has been proposed, and it's one I've spoken about for years and I appreciate it was discussed in December, is this concept of firstly the high risk herds are, are treated very intensely to reduce risk, but also this concept of risk based trading. And that is a process of essentially allowing trade as much as possible while minimising the, the potential for for uh, high-risk herds to transfer infection to low. And it's an approach uh, that was the centre piece of the Australian program. And, and that's, that's important because basically the whole of the country was under risk-based trading. In New Zealand, it's also a key component, but in New Zealand, there's very few infected herds. But it's essentially a process of farmers of a particular risk selling cattle to herds of equivalent or high risk and sourcing from herds of equivalent or lower risk. And Chair, my last point, and apologies it's lengthy, but my last point um, uh, relates to uh, industry engagement. I, I think it's fair to summarise that TB is widely considered a government problem here in Ireland. And that really is in fundamental contrast to international examples of success. Uh, and, uh, 
and in those international examples, and I, and I go back to those four countries, and I'm afraid the UK struggles from very similar problems to us, but the problem is a lot worse. But in Australia and New Zealand are the only other two countries in a similar situation, and they were, have been very successful. The, the, the story of industry engagement was fundamentally different. And uh, the, uh, the situation there was that industry representatives uh, were, uh, and government were in, have been very involved in genuine and regular engagement, open and honest uh, engagement, and building a trusting environment where real issues can be addressed together. And I highlight at the end of page 16 some comments from the Australian program, or indeed from the New Zealand program, where the program is run by, uh, it's actually a non, it's a, it's a, a non-government organisation. And as part of that issue of industry engagement, where it's very much about joint decision making, uh, cost sharing has been a key component of that. And I highlight in this paper several different models of cost sharing uh, that have been used. Uh, and, and lastly, I highlight the issue of the, uh, the TB Stakeholder Forum, which is a very important initiative here, seeking in part to try and bridge towards genuine industry engagement. And I also highlight the issue of Animal Health Ireland, which is also seeking to do that, and that's clearly in an Irish context. So, th thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Moore, for a very informative uh, presentation. Uh, now, I have a number of questioners. First of all, Deputy Cahill, Deputy Penrose, Deputy Kenny, first of all, please. Thank you, Chairman. And thanks, Professor Moore, for what is indeed a very, very detailed presentation. And obviously, he has a huge amount of study given into the whole, the whole thing of, of TB, of the whole um, TB eradication in, in this country. And I suppose. The first thing I'd want to do is we want to be sure that we don't eradicate the farm or while we're trying to cure the problem. But, you know, um, he just only the very last cost sharing by the government and the industry. Farmers have been paying for TB testing here now for a number of years. And, you know, it is not an insignificant cost at farm level. So, you know, farmers, the cost sharing by government and industry, um, definitely farmers are carrying a cost. And I think at that stage, when, when farmers agree to pay for their test, I think the break the breakdown was 50-50 between the between the, the government and what what farmers would contribute by paying for their for their annual round test. And I'm open to to correction on the on, on the percentage, but there, there definitely was an agreement, and I think it was a 50-50 cost sharing when when we agreed to carry before we agreed to pay for for testing. There was a levy paid on all animals, and um, we abandoned paying the levy, and we we, we, we went to uh, pay, pay, paying for paying for our tests. Residue infection, um, Professor, and you know, there's your, on page 13 there you talk about residue infection. And listening to you and listening, obviously, listen, your, your huge and depth of knowledge on this, you're re are you questioning the, you know, the, the testing that we have and the, the inability of the testing that we're doing to find all reactors? Or is it that it's impossible to have a test? That can that can that can identify residue infection, because you know if we're leaving residue infection there with the tests we have, it's it's um, you know it's a serious indictment of the of the of the whole testing regime we have, and I'd just like you to expand a bit on that residue infection. And is there, you know, is there a test out there that's that, that's better as regards um, residue infection? And just on the whole idea question, um, Professor Moore, you, you know, you talk about you know, uh, the lack of information that's there. But like, if you talk to farmers in Wicklow, you definitely won't have to, you know, they, they, they are in your, your, you do show figures here where TB was um, pre present, I think 16% in some parts of Wicklow. And the reality is in some parts of Wicklow now, um, farmers stopped keeping bovines because they just couldn't get free of the disease. But the, only, the inconsistency I just see here in what you're saying is that in most areas of, the, of Ireland, there's no evidence of support of deer acting as a maintenance host for TB. And I, I can't see why deer in Wicklow are, are different to deer in Tipperary or deer somewhere else. Because I know in my county, Tipperary, which I represent, there has been a few very bad outbreaks of TB over the last, say, three years. And a large proportion of them are adjacent to forestry. And 
I would be most definitely convinced that deer are playing a part in it. And whether deer, whether cattle are infecting deer or deer are infecting cattle, to me, doesn't make an awful lot of difference. Uh, it's the fact that if deer are playing a part in the spread of the disease, whether they're, whether they're misfortunate to pick it up from cattle, if they have the ability to spread it, and the, the, the vast distance that you know you, you're focused there on cattle and cattle movements, the vast uh, amount of ground that deer travel across the countryside, uh, definitely any farmer that's anywhere near a forestry and uh, that has trouble with TB, you definitely won't convince them that deer have haven't a part to play in it. You, you're focused there on, on BVD and you know the, the failure to take out PIs and. Uh, you know, to say that that was that was bordering on the criminal, I would agree fully. But you know, I would have to say that on that, it was Parkman's drawing up of the legislation when we started testing for BVD, or the lack of legislation, I suppose, would be more accurate. Like keeping PIs in place, uh, you know, just shouldn't have been tolerated. And at the end of the day, again, farmers are carrying the cost of that, and a programme that we were told was going to be a three-year programme. And I remember at the start of it, we were told that we did the voluntary year. At the start of it, we'd only have two years to do it. We're now into six or seven years of it, and, and no sign of an end in sight. And um, again, it's adding a cost to every calf that's, that's born. And again, it is the, it is the farmer is carrying it. But I suppose you know the focus of your presentation is that, if, 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 I, if I read it correctly, is that we need greater risk-based cattle controls. And to say that sends a shiver up my spine in that the, the department will be putting extra controls on, on cattle movements, uh, which will bring undoubtedly extra costs into the system. And again, it will be the farmer will be carrying the can. And I, you know, it was hinted here with us before when we had department officials in, that, and you have it here in your document, uh, Professor Moore, that herds are at risk for 10 years for 10 years after a TB outbreak, uh, outbreak, that there is a risk factor in, in herds. Well, if that's the case, and you're going to put, uh, you know, uh, a black mark again, a herd that's had, had TB in the last 10 years, it's going to have a huge, huge impact on cattle trade. And um, whether it's a calf, a whaling, or whatever it is, a store, there's going to be a screen up in the mark to say, well, this herd had TB in the last six months, or this herd had TB in the last two years, or this herd had TB, whenever it was. Like, in practicality, that's going, to, that's going to discriminate against herds, and it's going to put some farmers at a huge financial disadvantage. And if that's the weapon that we're going to try and use to eradicate TB, it's going to cause a um, huge financial hardship out there. And I just, I just couldn't see how any farmers could agree could agree that to allow a system like that operate. And I think the two things, I think it goes back to the first point I made, Professor, about the residue of the infection. And like, if, if you were saying, I don't doubt your expertise for a minute, Professor, uh, uh, I've heard you on a lot of different forums over the years, but like, if we're doing a test that we're not happy that we're leaving reactors after us, uh, to me that is the hub of the issue. And is there any, you know, you talked about where they go out in Australia, in Australia, and in fairness to Australia, to eradicate a country of TB with the amount of wildlife they have was a very significant achievement. But did they operate the skin and blood tests like we're doing here, or had they an, an additional weapon, weapon in their armory, armory to do that? Because like this thing, putting in extra controls up to 10 years on, 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 on cattle movement, uh, and putting black marks again, 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 different herds. I just could not see in, in practicality how that could work. And I suppose, you know, you didn't mention brucellosis in your, in, in, in your thing, and we did finally eradicate brucellosis. And we eradicated it by very extensive testing. But the test was accurate. And we did eradicate it. And I was a farm leader before, before I came into this house, and I remember defending very strongly at a meeting with the department that, that we had to keep post-moving testing in place for another three years, um, and that was essential to do it, even though others at the table didn't agree. But that's what was finally eradicated, and we were in that place a number of years earlier, and we relaxed the, the testing regime, and we got back to square one again as regards brucellosis. But like, we were confident with brucellosis, 
that we that we had an accurate test, and we once you you were identified, and we and we were, we were making progress, and we did eradicate it. Thankfully, you know, we have even stopped testing for brucellosis now on our herds, and like that that was that was a huge major achievement. But like, I know I'm repeating myself now here, Professor, but like. If we have a test that's leaving residue of infection after it, um, how do you think we can eradicate it baffles me. And again, this 10-year um, restriction on, on herds, uh, that's not, that's, in my view, that is just not practical. Next Deputy. Uh, Deputy Penrose, next please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Person. Uh, Professor Moore, thank you for your paper. It's very illuminating and learned paper, obviously. And I have to say, I said here today that the Department of Veterinary Officials were giving their evidence or making their presentation. Uh, that, and I indicated that day that I thought that, that was in 2018, or a few months ago, that uh, we'd be talking about it in, 19, in, in 2040, 2045. I was wrong. We'll be, we'll be people, I'll be long dead, and so lots of people. It'll be in 2060 and it'll be still going on. I said that we, well, there's a river you might be familiar with, the River Shannon. We live down there. There's people talking about draining it back in the 50s. But at the same time, coincidentally, as the TB eradication program commenced. But there's a better chance of the channel being drained than TB being eradicated. So let's be clear. And remember, we have already spent a good of 8 billion euro. And the department indicated the last of the rain, they would take another billion. Well, they're wrong. Because the Brit Britain leaving the EU was going to cost 12 billion. And we will far exceed that sum by the time this game is over. And you can see why. You have identified it very well, because other people skirted around it, but you didn't. So we, had, we had a programme that was only just a containment programme. A control or a containment programme, that's all. It was never meant to eliminate. And it vindicates a view you heard back in the 70s when I was in the college myself. It was never going to clear out the system. And let's be clear, Professor, the vaccination of badgers. We, we, first of all, the Department of Agriculture has to run off and get permission from the National Parks and Wildlife to do so many. So there's no, wide, there's no widespread program of vaccination of badgers. It's very controlled, isn't it? Am I correct in that? That was the evidence I thought I heard the last day from the Department. They only could do so many with the, with the, with the approval of the National Parks and Wildlife. So put that little bony one side, and so that's, that's another one gone down the drain. So, and then we have the, the programme that you, you're, you're right. I mean, Deputy Cal is right. Once you have a, a vaccine, we had loads of lo false positives and false negatives and everything else. And when you, have, when you hit the, the button here, when you have a residual, where there's going to be some in the herd that's not going to be detected at all, there ain't no chance. You have a better chance of winning the, that lottery you did last week. The, than, 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 than the, and, and the ordinary people are looking in and wondering. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot of money. I know Debbie Cal says a lot of money, but a lot of uh, state money going in there as well. A huge amount of money. And, and this, this is going on, and, and it's. it's, it's, it's uh, could you tell us how Australia got, got down, seeing that you're, you're from Australia yourself, down in, in the 2002, the last outbreak? I know it have a different system and everything else. But yet have an awful lot of animals and possible vectors and carriers and hosts and everything else. We have, I'd say we have about, or are we, are we sure that the possible carriers or potential carriers are cattle themselves, wildlife, I suppose, badger and deer? Is that, is that the height of us or is there something hidden that, that, there might, that might be that we don't know about? Uh, because the, the, the thing, and I, I know the concept of the reproduction ratio, I used to study it one time, but I've lost all. But this number of secondary cases, even with the vaccination, you're only tiddling below one. So, you know, I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't know where this is going to, um, you know, where it's going to end. I know I, I'd say if I, if I was going back to college again, I'd become a vet because the, vet, the vets will be demanded forever, not just for border control, but for everything else. <laughs> I don't think they will. It's so poorly paid now. I'd rather be a vet. <laughs> so, but in any event, um, it, it, is, it is a source of concern, you know what I mean? And, and you're saying we have to tighten up uh, the risk based management and the two tier test um, and the skin test that they're not sufficient, that 
that, they're, they, that we're a victim of legislation because the legislation is not tight enough. Normally we're a victim. Anything that comes from Europe is a strangling piece of legislation. And so I'm very worried to hear you say that. Um, but uh, this risk-based approach system, could you explain it? Is, is it a system where those that are in the higher risk category sell from one to the other and then, or, or, or what, or to sell, or is it lower risk people sell just to lower risk people, or what way does that work? It'd be an interesting thing to try to get it operating here in Ireland. That we, you know, it'd be, it certainly, it certainly does, it represents a challenge in, in my view, uh, in, in this regard. But you have clearly tried to extrapolate from international experience, uh, generally from your international contacts, as to the possible role of deer as a reservoir host with spillback to cattle. Um, nobody can of those who have been involved in it for a while are wondering why, how could, uh, he's right, why could something that fairly virulent in Wicklow not apply in Tipperary or Westmead or wherever? Uh, and, you know, the persistency, um, I, I, I'm absolutely, are you advocating that the only way we can tackle this is go straight in on a scheme or a system or somehow model, and model under compulsory national bovine fire dairy the BVD eradication programme? Is there, is there a parallel that can be drawn with that that might get, might get an earlier result that before I die I'll see it eradicated rather than when I'm, I'm, I'm well gone? Um, but but um, I have to say, you, ha you, have, um, you have only vindicated my layman's view of it. Um, there will be ten parliaments gone through here and they will be discussing it, if, if, if whoever the historians will be around to, to evaluate it at that time. Kenny. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Well, uh, for your, your, your document, which, as has been said by others, is very detailed and uh, I suppose goes to the, the core of the problem here. Um, I, I was interested, I was doing a little bit of looking a few things up, and I, I noticed that uh, there, there came a delegation, I think, from Animal Health New Zealand came to Ireland in 2008, and they visited Ireland and Britain to talk about how successful they had been and, and, and what, what measures um, could be used. And one of the things that and you mentioned in your paper about the, um, the possum, I think it was, was the, the main spreader of, the, of the, the TB, particularly in New Zealand, and how they used a vaccination programme, and it seemed to work very well, and how the same vaccination programme had been tested here in Ireland and had been found to be successful. And I just wonder, has, is that the one that's been licensed? Is that the one that's going to be used here, or have we developed something, something different? Um, the, the possibility of, of, of using a vaccine, particularly for, for badgers, I think is one of the things that, and as Deputy Penrose said, you know, it seems to have to get over all these hurdles, which, uh, as they're a somewhat protected species and all of that, as to how we're going to get around that. Um, and how successful in reality, because it's, it's a different animal in a different country, in a different environment, how successful in reality is it going to be to be able to trap and vaccinate the numbers of badgers that would actually make a difference? Uh, and obviously it would have to be done in all parts of the country at the same time over a sustained period. And has there any cost that's been done as to the level of cost that's involved in trying to get that to happen? Um, the issue of deer as well, and it was interesting because I, I know certainly around me where we have a lot of forestry, we have a lot of deer. And uh, I noted when I was looking up things here that, that the first badger in Ireland to be found to be infected with TB was in 1974, and there was 20 years of studies before it was determined that it was actually the badger was spreading the TB. So we're, we're now saying, you know, we're looking at the deer, and yeah, in some cases it is, and in some cases it isn't, and all of that, and it's, it's inconclusive. Um, and I, I, I just hope we don't have to wait 20 years to, to come to a conclusion in respect of that. Uh, the, the other issue which you mentioned is, is about the, that in, in different parts of the country there seems to be, and something I come across before, different strains of TB. And uh, if, if there's different strains, would that be one of the reasons why uh, there may be perhaps be carried more by, by, certain, by certain wildlife in some areas than it will be in others because it's a different strain that's there? What, what element of, 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 um, 
of research has been done into that. Uh, you mentioned about the, the, the accuracy of the testing, and that's something that has always bothered me and bothered an awful lot of farmers around the country, where they go down with TB, and when the animal goes to the factory, they found there's no lesions, that it's a false positive. And yet they're locked up, as we say. They can't, they can't sell, they can't do anything. And there seem to be, you seem to be saying that there's also, in many cases, false positives that don't show up. And if, if that is the case, um, has there, in, 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 in the countries where, you know, this question was already, in the countries where there has been successful eradication programs, is there a different method of testing? Is there a better method of testing? Is there a more conclusive test that can be done? Uh, the movements and the movement of cattle and the two clear tests, and that if, if, if you get two clear tests, you can move your cattle and you can begin to trade again. Uh, and uh, you're pointing out that the, the possibility of, of false positives there is a, is a danger in, in, in respect of that, and there needs to be a longer period. If you're saying there's a longer period, how much of a longer period? Like you mentioned 10 years, which is more than the lifetime of most of the animals, so I, I can't see how, you know, there has to be, there has to be something within, within reason. What kind of period would you be talking about that would actually, would actually work? Uh, the, the, the risk of, of trade and of movement and of all of that, uh, for, for many cases, and, and I know it's, it's another interesting aspect of it, and I, I just wonder your view on it, there are some closed farm systems where there are animals, bovines there with TB that are kept and are finished and are sent to the factory, but they can't leave that farm. That is, that is something that I know concerns farmers that neighbour those, because they see wildlife, doesn't know which farm is, is, got, is a closed system and isn't and is crossing in and out through them. And there are issues there, I think, that we'd, we'd like to get to the bottom as to how, uh, how suitable that really is, if we're, if we're serious about eradicating TB. And that's something, I suppose, that uh, Deputy Penrose has alluded to. That there's many people in the farming community that don't believe we're serious about eradicating TB in this country, that we have had... Uh, at this stage, generations of, of people in, the, in, 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 in the, the industry which has become the, the TB eradication industry and, and huge amounts of money being paid for what was a containment policy up to now that was sold as being an eradication policy. Uh, the, 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 other, the other, I suppose, um, aspect of it, you, you mentioned Australia and New Zealand and, and, and the successes there's been there. Uh, in, in, in other European countries, I just wonder what level of success is there. What, I, I know Britain has huge problems and, and that's clear, we, we know those, but in, in, other, in other parts of Europe uh, which may have uh, perhaps a similar climate and, and more similar wildlife type uh, problems as we have here, how, how, how successful or unsuccessful have they been in respect to that? I'll leave it at that, Chairman. Thank you. Next Deputy. First of all, when you're ready, I'll come back to you. Thank you. Thanks very much. I, I'll, I, I hope I will be able to answer every question, but if I don't, please, please let yeah, me know. Um, so, uh, Deputy Cahill, um, thank you very much for the questions. Um, I, I, I'd like to preface my responses to all of these questions in terms of what I see my role as. And it's not just my role, but I would see the role of scientists in, in what we're, we're trying to do is to give our best understanding of the situation. And I, and I would suggest that my role is much, much easier than my policy colleagues, because they have to make decisions as, of course, that's what you folks do, whereas we're just trying to clarify the facts. And so, so that's the first thing. So I, 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 um, and, and I think I also I want to be very clear that I'm not trying to suggest that the situation is, is hopeless. I'm not trying to do that at all. What I'm trying to say, based on all of the evidence that I've put together, based on lots of work by lots of people, is that for us to realistically be shifting towards eradication, I think we need to do a lot more. And I think it needs to be very focused. Um, and, and, and that's based on all of the reasons that I said. Now, I'd like to, if, just if I could, um, um, Deputy Cahill, in, in terms of the, the, and also Deputy Kenny as well, in terms of the, 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 the accuracy of the test, um, the tests being used here are, uh, uh, if I, if I, they're really no different to those being used el elsewhere. The tools we use here are the tools available. In fact, it's important to remember that the, the gamma test, it was actually uh, invented in Australia at the very end of their program, but they never used it. 
They never really used it. But it's been very helpful to us subsequently. But these are imperfect tests. And if I could just give you an example, and I gave it recently in an IG. I think it was a Yonis disease IG. Because we had the same problem there with tests. If, if mainly men, um, if we go and get a, a test for prostate, you know, prostate test, um, at the end of the day, we, or, or, or it could be a, 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 a prostate test, we know that when we come out of that, okay, the result is negative, but that doesn't mean that we definitely haven't got it. It could be early. Uh, there could be lots of reasons. And in fact, there's also big problems of false positives with the, with the blood test used for prostate. So we're using these imperfect tests, and TB is no different. And it was spoken to previously about false positives, false negatives. There's not a lot of false positives, but there, 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 there are these false negatives. So, so fundamentally, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find a way forward uh, despite the imperfect tests. Um, and uh, and so, so that is why, for example, we know that the skin test uh, doesn't pick up all of the infected, and it's not very good at early infection. And that's why the gamma was, in, it was introduced. It's much better at doing that, although it throws up false positives. But, but, but to be honest, the problem we face with TB is, is actually no, genuinely, it's no different to most animal health or indeed human health issues where we're trying to do the best we can with tests that are imperfect. And that is why um, different countries have used this concept of risk-based trading. And, and, and uh, uh, Deputy Penrose, I'll come back to the issue in a second to provide a little bit more detail. So are there better tests? Are there better weapons? The answer is no. We're not going to get... I don't think we're going to get a better diagnostic test. Well, certainly there's none that I'm aware of on the horizon. And at the end of the day, it will never be 100% effective. I, I would think that would be very, very rare for a test to be that. So we're trying to use other models to help us. Uh, Deputy Cahill, you spoke about the model of cost sharing and the fact that farmers pay 50%. I, I absolutely don't dispute that. I guess what concerns me is that the methodology that we use of cost sharing here in this country, it creates resentment in so much as farmers, don't, quite reasonably, they don't want to pay that. And they have no real say in where this program is going. So it's really an issue of, the, I think the percentage is important, and I've given some detail in the paper, but it's more, uh, if I could perhaps use the New, New Zealand story as an example, where an agreement was made about what percentage would be covered. There would be an envelope around all of the program costs, and industry will pay X percent, say 50 percent. It's a little bit more, I think it's 56. It doesn't really matter. But then, every decision that's made 50% of the, of the input comes from farmers. And if they have a good year and the cost for go down, then the cost of farmers go down too. Or if they really need to seriously ramp things up, the cost of farmers go up. So farmers are absolutely central to the whole process of decision making. Um, and, uh, and, and they know, in fact, it's within their grasp that they can eradicate. So they're willing to do that. Whereas here there is no connect. I think it's fair to say. So farmers quite recently, of course it's a point of huge resentment, but they have no say. Um, it doesn't matter whether things go good, bad or indifferent, they're going to be charged the same amount. So, so that, that, it's that issue. Um, in terms of the deer question, why, why are deer in Wicklow different? I'm not sure I can answer that. Um, w one of the things, we work with biological systems and things are... We're, we're, you know, it's not always entirely clear. But I would suggest that we do know, based on international experience, that as you aggregate species, so as you get increasing contact between deer and also increasing contact between deer and infected species, as you increase densities, those things are drivers for shifting from a spillover to a maintenance host. So we're working at the moment on first principles. The fact that 16% of deer are infected um, uh, doesn't necessarily mean that they're driving the problem. We, we don't know that. Um, um, uh, the, the question by, uh, I'm sorry, De Deputy uh, Kenny, if I could come back to you, just in terms of 20 years <coughs> to clarify the role of badges, and this relates to the question that you asked, but the, the, the story with badges, how it worked was, they found infection in badgers. That actually means absolutely nothing until we clarify what role they're playing. 
And the work that was done, and there was two very large, and I think very fine studies done from the late 80s through to the, for almost 20 years, as you say, um, was what they did in East Offaly and then the Four Area Project, they actually removed badges from swathes of the country, from areas, and they compared that with, uh, essentially they're comparing cattle plus badges versus cattle only. And what they found is that the level of TB fell significantly in areas of cattle only, indicating the only explanation was that badges are, are very much driving the situation. With deer, it's more difficult. It's, it's not really possible for us to remove deer from, 100% of deer from, well, I guess it's possible, but it's hugely resource intensive. And we have an opportunity to use a completely different methodology now, which has only emerged in the last couple of years, which I mentioned, which is this strain typing, uh, sorry, not strain typing, whole genome, whole genome sequencing, which helps us to understand directionality. Um, and I think that will be a methodology, it's only just been introduced, that will help us. Um, uh, whether that will help us quickly to clarify the epidemiological role, I don't know. Um, I think Ireland could really benefit from particularly colleagues from the US who've really sought to really clarify the role of deer in their setting. And in fact, one of the beauties of science is that we work internationally all the time. So, you know, we know these folks. And, and in fact, they were very helpful to me in developing this paper. Um, um, the, 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 the issue of extra controls, the context, the, and the sole context I'm saying this is, is, in, is based on lessons from that graph from the BVD story where I think it's important for us to be realistic. Um, I think it's, it, it's certainly wrong for me to say, you know, what we're doing is fine when I don't think that's the case. Uh, it's absolutely fine for control, but in terms of us eradicating, because as you, Deputy Kenny, had indicated, we're so close to one post, post the, um, the, the badge of vaccination, and that's over the whole of the country, uh, 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 Deputy Penrose, that's not just defined areas, the, the aim is to eradicate, uh, to vaccinate over the whole of the country. The modelling is based, and this is modelling, but it's based on a coverage of 40%. So 40% of badges would be immune at any point in time. If we could drive that coverage higher, um, that would drive this R value lower. But 40% we thought was probably realistic, remembering that there's new badges being born all the time and they need to be vaccinated, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, brucellosis, I, I absolutely appreciate, uh, Deputy Carl, your comment of the test it was much more accurate. I think we had another great tool that if you got brucellosis wrong, you found out very quickly. Uh, you know, and we don't have that with TB. It could could sit there. We know. In fact, I, I was I was very involved. I was not very. I was involved in the final cases of TB in Australia, and it was at that point that you could disentangle everything that was happening. At the moment in Ireland, we've got everything happening simultaneously, and it is very difficult to disentangle what's going on. But there, the very final cases, it was possible to show that um, uh, how important residual infection was. It was It was possible to say that. It was, in fact, one of the final cases was a clearance sale, what we in Australia call a clearance sale, a farm shutting down. They distributed to 40 farms over two states, and you could trace all of those cattle. I mean, you could not do that here because there is so many, so much happening in terms of, in terms of TB. The question, Deputy Penrose, is it possible to eradicate TB? Um, certainly, there is international examples of success. Um, the, the story in Australia, the story in New Zealand, the story in the UK, the story uh, in European countries I'll come to in a moment, is it's all different. In Australia, their problems were mainly with respect to cattle control. They had two wildlife species that worried them. One was feral buffalo, and with feral buffalo, in fact, they were a maintenance host. It's just that feral buffalo lived in a different area from feral cattle. But nonetheless, they, they eradicated TB from feral buffalo by eradicating feral buffalo. The other one was feral pigs. There's 26 million feral pigs in Australia, much more than people, or a little bit more than people. And they were finding TB in pigs. Feral pigs, wild, just like wild boar here. And, but they realised pretty quickly that what was happening there was that feral pigs were actually eating infected cattle carcasses. But as soon as those carcasses disappeared with the program, there wasn't maintenance of infection in feral pigs. If there had been maintenance, they would not have, I don't think they would have eradicated TB. Whereas in New Zealand, it's completely different. In New Zealand, what's happened is, um, in fact, they've almost eradicated TB from cattle, 
but they have large areas of the country with very heavy densities or populations of a feral species, an Australian species called a, 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 a brush-tailed possum. And so now they're moving from trying to eradicate TB in cattle to actually trying to eradicate it from possums. And Deputy, um, Deputy, Deputy Kenny, you asked the question about different countries of Europe. And, and I appreciate, of course, the examples there are important. Spain, France, Germany, TB is re-emerging. Uh, they had it at very low levels in, in, in Spain, but particularly in France, uh, TB is becoming increasingly problematic, and it's also starting to re-emerge in, 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 in Germany, the very south of Germany in, 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 in the Alps. And each of those is essentially Primarily, but although I suspect in, in, in Spain there's cattle involvement too, but in France it appears that badgers and perhaps deer. In Germany it appears to be deer. In Spain it appears to be uh, wild boar and deer, different species of deer. But then uh, I know our Spanish colleagues, there's also the issue of cattle controls that become increasingly important as well. The question, uh, Deputy Kenny, you asked about closed farm systems. In fact, uh, I, I also think that's a very reasonable concern. Is there a risk posed to, for example, large feedlots in terms of neighbouring herds? And that is a study that, in fact, one of my colleagues, uh, Jamie Madden, here in the audience, is just starting to address. And again, that, that highlights that we, we work very closely with our policy colleagues to provide the science to help support policy decision making. That's been identified as a concern and, and we will now seek to, to, um, to answer that question. Is it or not? Um, the, 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 you ask, also asked the question, how long should restrictions occur? What's, what's the, you know, a 10 year sounds like a long period of time. Um, I'm not sure I have a, a, a direct answer. I guess what we're wanting is we, we need to somehow control... Uh, control's not the right word. We need to be able to cope with trade while also coping with TB eradication. That's the fundamental problem. And so this issue of risk-based trading, the Australian example, it may not be entirely appropriate, was eight years. So you're moving, it took eight years to get from immediately the point of de-restriction through to when a herd could trade with anyone. But over that inter interim period, they could trade with lots of different uh, herds, but that, it had to be very carefully done. And, and uh, De Deputy uh, Penrose, you were asking how did it work. How it worked was they actually had two, two layers of risk-based trading. One layer was it was a state-based system. They eradicated TB from the south of Australia extremely quickly. It only took a few years. So Tasmania had a risk status, then Victoria, then South Australia, etc. So there was an area-based status. So you couldn't trade between a herd, you couldn't sell cattle from a herd of, of a riskier state to a herd of less risky. So there was a state-based directional movement, but there was also a movement within states. So basically saying if you're, you know, you're, uh, you, were restrict, you were released from restriction four years ago, so you're you know, medium risk, it meant that you could buy, you could buy from herds of equivalent or lower risk, and you could sell to herds of equivalent or worse risk. So it was just to ensure that any trade in stock didn't essentially, didn't essentially uh, uh, cause backtracking of the program. How does that affect the sustainability of the farms? From a I, commercial uh, point of view. Yes, it's a it's it's it, it's a really important question. I, I cannot I can I, I I've asked my Australian colleagues specifically that question, and uh, I, I I I don't yet have an answer, and I will send that to you. I was a a farmer's son, and. Uh, uh, certainly, it just became something that people lived with. It, it, I, don't, I don't think... I, I know it has caused huge concern in Ireland. I, I'm well aware of the concerns, and, um, and, and I, I absolutely understand them. What I'm saying is that from a technical point of view, and that's where I'm coming from, from a technical point of view, we don't have a better solution, given, given all of the constraints that I've mentioned. Um, but I, I, I will come back to you if okay. you wouldn't mind. Yeah, I appreciate once, that. Once, yeah. once, I, okay. once it's clear. Okay. Sorry, the different strains of TB. Yes. Strains, does, that, does that make a difference? Sorry, Chairman. No, of course. Um, uh, I, I, again, I think I probably need 
uh, colleagues of greater expertise to answer that, uh, Deputy Kenny. But, but uh, to the best of my knowledge, and, and I will check this, and if, if I could come back to the Secretary, um, I will check this. But to the best of my knowledge, the, the story with Ireland is we don't have a lot of strain typing information. Uh, and this has been very different to the UK, where there's been very fine strain typing information. But in saying that, the, the strains, uh, the, the methodology available for strain typing, typing has been quite rudimentary until recently. And that's where this whole genome sequencing has come in. And, and Ireland is not far behind the curve in terms of, we have some incredibly fine scientists who will, who will drive that agenda forward, very much supported by policy colleagues. In terms of, uh, are there certain strains, you know, where wildlife are more susceptible? My understanding is no. But I'd like to clarify that, if you don't mind. Oh. Deputy McConnell. Um, thank you, Chairperson, and um, thanks, Professor Moore, for a very uh, interesting and insightful presentation. Um, just a couple of questions in relation to in relation to the, the pre-movement test, which is being proposed at European level at the moment, that would be is to be adopted, uh, proposed to be adopted here as well. Um, that if a herd is six months out of test that um, they have to have a pre-movement test within 30 days, 30 days of movement. Um, is there any scientific basis to that in terms of, uh, from your understanding, in terms of that assisting, to the, eradica assisting the eradication program? Um, and would it actually uh, be productive in any way or uh, would, it, would, it, would it make an impact? Um, and then just in relation to um, in relation to what you're saying overall, if I'm right, is, is what you're saying is that without, without introducing a risk-based um, movement system, um, that, that, is, that is the essential thing which uh, made the difference in Australia and New Zealand, and that uh, that's the only way uh, we can go which actually would see um, and is an absolute, absolutely essential if we are to actually um, if we are actually to uh, to, to see get close to eradication here, um, and just finally in relation to the issue of deer, um, I'm just not quite clear from what you've said already. Uh, and you mentioned that uh, in some of the European countries, um, TB is re-emerging or growing, and you mentioned deer in relation to that as well. Um, do we have is there conclusive evidence in any any places of deer transferring? TB um, to cattle. I know you indicated that uh, um, and the, intensity, the, the, the intensity of the presence of deer, etc. You had mentioned that there was, uh, in relation to um, fodder being shared, uh, am, am I right in saying that in those instances there was proof that it was transferring or just su suspicion? Um, and uh, if so, can you elaborate in terms of um, the mechanisms and the means by which deer, by which um, it's transferable from from um, from deer to cattle. Thank you. Thanks, Deputy Professor Moore. Thank you, thank you, um, uh, Deputy McAnalogue. So, in terms of pre-movement testing, in terms of pre-movement testing, um, we did a study about oh goodness, it's probably 12 years ago now, where we specifically investigated whether pre-movement testing would be useful here, and what we did is it was it was a little bit like a cost-benefit, because it's, there's, there's a lot of effort involved in pre-movement testing, and would that help in terms of picking up more breakdowns? Our view at the time is that pre-movement testing would, would only be useful in a very targeted way, essentially focusing on high-risk herds. That was the conclusion of our study. The, I'd like to make two broader points, though. In terms of first principles, going back to first principles, uh, of course, if if this is a high-risk herd and you're having animals moving out of that herd, you, if, if, those, if those animals are tested at appropriate times, then six months is probably appropriate because it takes time for the, the infection to develop and, they've, and to also test positive to the test. Um, it, it potentially could be useful. Um, I guess, I guess I, 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 I'd like to digress slightly because I do have concerns that here in Ireland, we make a lot of animal-based decisions. So we have an infected herd, and then we're essentially saying, from that infected herd, um, if we do certain things that these 
this, this group of animals are, are, are safe and these group perhaps are not so safe. And I, I, I would have concerns that we, our tests, uh, uh, we're, we're really stretching the ability of the test to do that. And if you were to move to a risk-based situation, it is much safer to work at a herd level. So we're saying that all of the animals in the herd are essentially of equivalent status, whereas pre-movement testing is moving from that to actually looking at individual animal. Uh, and and as, as I said, we're, you know, we know, uh, just to give you the numbers, we know uh, um, an animal, say an animal's infected, the probability with a skin test we're going to pick up infection on average is 50%. But it will be much generally higher if it's been, you know, it's later in the course. It would be much less if it's less in the course. So everything helps. But I guess the fundamental question, question is, uh, are we doing enough? That's, that's, that's really where I'm coming from. Um, uh, you asked the question, uh, is there any other options apart from, apart from risk-based system? Um, I, 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 to be honest, I... I cannot see us, based on all of the evidence that I have in front of me, I would have real concerns about whether we, we can eradicate, certainly within a reasonable time, uh, without a, a, a really robust risk-based risk uh, system, which probably would need to include trading, unless we get a better test, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, story with, the story with deer is there evidence anywhere of infection drifting from deer to cattle? Um, I spoke at length about this with my colleagues from Michigan. My colleague from Michigan, uh, Dr. Dan O'Brien, who's extremely helpful. He works for the wildlife department there and has been very involved in that program. And I said, well, because I, I wanted to know exactly the same, because, you know, what, 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 how, did, how do they know? And they're very confident that the deer, white-tailed deer in Michigan are a maintenance host with spilled back to cattle. And, and they were actually a bit fortuitous because what they did is they found evidence of TB in deer populations where there could not have been cattle involvement. That was fundamentally the story. I don't think we'd ever get that here in Ireland because deer and cattle coexist. Um, I think, though, I think, though, that, w that w um, our best hope is, is whole genome sequencing. But the organism that causes TB is, 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 is problematic because whole genome sequencing, how it works is it's actually saying, well, the org if I pass an organism from me to you, for example, that the organism here, uh, it's, mu it's mutated as it shifted across, and I know the direction of mutation, therefore I know it's moved in that direction. And most organisms change quite frequently, whereas with TB, the organism that causes TB might only change, I understand, from my expert colleagues, um, um, uh, two colleagues from UCD, uh, Steve Gordon and, and Joe Crispell, who are, who are leading this work, is that it might only change once every two years. So that makes it very difficult. So, but nonetheless, and I highlighted in the paper, there's, there's work from New Zealand, there's work from certainly the US that's just been published that would suggest, and the UK I think, that would suggest that we are starting to get clues about a, a directionality that will help us. How is it transferred? Um, the, 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 our best understanding, I think it probably could be transferred in lots of different ways, but um, the, the way that is most likely is, is, is essentially when there is a sharing of aerosols. And the reason for that is that the organism itself, um, for it to establish infection most effectively, it has to be what's called a droplet nuclei, which is, which is the way it's presented when you breathe out. So, and, and if you breathe out and you have infectious material, when the next uh, uh, deer or cattle or whatever breathes in, it can, it's in the form that it can go all the way down to the lowest parts of the lung. And they reckon, my expert colleagues reckon that you might only need 10 organisms to establish infection if it's presented that way, where you might need 10,000 or 100,000 organisms for it to establish if you were to ingest it. So it's really an issue of risk. So, so um, um, sharing pasture is uh, my understanding, and this is based on the best principles because we don't know everything about TB, but based on best our current understanding is that um, uh, 
close contact sharing pasture, particularly when there's an opportunity to share aerosols, is probably the most effective way. But we certainly cannot say, and we cannot say this for badgers either, that um, perhaps sharing pasture or, or cattle grazing near a latrine isn't possible. But it's probably an issue of how frequently it occurs, how much dose of organism is present, etc. Thank you very much, Professor. Any more questions? Yes, yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry Deputy Murphy. Over, yeah. over uh, all that has been said here, but just one question uh, may have been asked already. Is there any evidence to show that close to forestry there is a greater risk to cattle? Now, I'm only thinking of my own county, where a number of breakouts over the year, it all seemed to be close to, to a forestry area, and on the basis now that you know forestry is going to be uh, such a major part of our economy going forward, uh, won't we need to be very aware of this? Um, uh, Deputy Murphy, thank you for the question. Um, in fact, the, to my knowledge, there has there has been no work done. There's, there's, there's and, and perhaps there should be. Um, the, the, over the years, there's been a lot of questions asked about whether disturbance, so this is a different question, but asked whether disturbance road building or, or indeed the cutting down of forestry uh, is, creates risks and, and often people find that it occurs co coincident or shortly before breakdowns. Whereas this is a different question, and it's, uh, I appreciate the question. Based on empirical evidence, we, to the best of my knowledge, we don't know. Based on first principles, so based on first principles, and this is going back to earlier comments that I made, if forestry encourages deer to increase in density and also increases the opportunity for aggregation with infected species, then in, based on first principles, of course, that would be an area of of potential concern in terms of shifting from this spillover to maintenance host. Yeah. But we have no empirical evidence. Um, uh, the well, on that point, uh, Deputy Murphy's point, Professor, if you look at a map of the country, yes. uh, from Irish point of view, uh, would it not be a fact that a number of the black spots, uh, under Wicklow for example, and Deputy Murphy's constituency, but Wicklow in particular, uh, it would be quite close to forestry area where the black spots tend to be. Would that be a fact or is that just Assumptions. I, I, uh, I, I guess I'd. Um, I suppose the problem. The point I'm making is, sorry, the point I'm making is, there's forests uh, have a lot of cover for wildlife, yeah. deer, yeah. badgers. I, I, uh, I, 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 I completely accept that. I guess the problem we've got from a scientific point of view is, <clears throat> is, I'm sure there are areas of the country where there's plenty of forests and there isn't TB problems. I, I, I would imagine. So, so it's really an issue of comparison. Um, it, it may well be, and I, we can certainly talk with policy, policy colleagues about this in terms of, you know, we would, uh, the, I guess the problem we've got is that, you know, the forestry, you know, you, the, the, there's forestry in a lot of different places and trying to get some understanding about, about you know, is the risk greater uh, uh, in all of those areas or is it only higher when there's a very large amount of forestry? These are questions that we could ask but we haven't asked as yet. I would appreciate if you might consider I will, asking, asking I'll, I'll, those. I'll pass to my policy colleagues. Because, just very briefly, I know of one case where there was quite a lot of disturbance uh, on a forest area a few years back and, you know, after that, I, I have no evidence to link it, but certainly there were three or four farmers very close to the forest area, affected by TB outbreak. It would say six, nine months after the disturbance. Whereas one might, one could assume that the wildlife were pushed out and, you know, ran from the forest when the when the when the, when the works were going on. I, I, again, it's just something I might like clarified, or if there was any possible questions could be asked on it for clarification, I would appreciate. It. Deputy McConnell, to conclude. Just one very brief clarification, Professor Moore. You mentioned in the study in Michigan that uh, it had been found that uh, TB was escalating in deer in a scenario where there was no bovines and where it couldn't be related to bovines. So that certainly showed that they were transmitting it among themselves. Does that can we say with certainty, therefore, that they also have the same capacity to transmit it to 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 bovines? Is that is that a definite? Or? 
it's it's a, it's a really good question. So so basically the and 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 uh, I think I I need to come back to you with very clear clarification. But this is my best understanding: is that it was first identified in deer back in the 70s. I think this is correct. And very quickly it became clear that it was in populations, not necessarily at high levels. My understanding is that TB in white-tailed deer has never been at high, high levels. Um, but it was in a situation where there was no other explanation apart from essentially self-sustaining uh, situation in, in, uh, in deer. And, and then, and then the, 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 the issue is that once that was, once that was clear, then the questions actually change because if you know it self-sustains in deer, you can actually say, well, is there evidence? Is there is there evidence to support the view that being a farm being close to deer is risky? And, and if that's the case, then that provides some evidence of spillback to cattle. But I'd like to speak, seek clarification from my Michigan colleagues and come back through the through the the secretary if I could, just to be sure. Could, could I just make one, yes, if, yeah, if, you don't, if you don't mind, just one other point that it might be useful, and it's a, it's a little bit of a story, but it relates to this issue of industry engagement, if I could. Um, so the Australian program, if I could give you this uh, very, very short situation, was the program started in the 70s. They made very rapid progress from the south heading north, but they got to the Kimberley, so this is basically country that you can't find all the cattle. It's a really difficult country to muster. They got to the north, which is the north of Western Australia. And the, it, was a, it was a program run by the, they called them the Canberra bureaucrats. Um, and uh, essentially the, can, the, the scientists and the bureaucrats in Canberra said, well, look, at this point forward, we're going to have to start depopulating properties. And the property owners in the north were, in, were incensed, absolutely incensed and uh, quite reasonably so, and, and essentially the whole program stopped. And from, for six months there was no action at all. And then eventually the Federal Minister for Agriculture stepped in and said, look, from this point forward, we're going to have producers, uh, farmers, we're going to have the industry, 50% of the decision making is going to be, there's going to be farmers on the board, and 50% will be bureaucrats. And, and the bureaucrats were, were really concerned because they said, well, these, the, the, the farmers are, you know, they're not going to really, are they going to make hard decisions? And the minister said also, and this was a key turning point for Australia, said from this point forward, it wasn't the case before that, but from this point forward, if we're going to have 50% farmers on the board, we're actually going to have 50% of the cost shared by farmers as well, as uh, Deputy Carl spoke of here. And what happened was really interesting because what happened was that the the program fundamentally changed. It actually became much more ruthless because the farmers realised it was their money. They were much more compassionate towards their own, their, their, their own but also they realised that if they were going to rid the country of TB, they couldn't make, they couldn't make easy, they had to make hard decisions. And from that point forward, the whole of the situation there, and it happened in New Zealand as well, it genuinely became a partnership between industry and government. Uh, it was a very, it really was a fundamental turning point back in 19, that was 1984, and they eventually eradicated in 2000, in cattle in 2002 in, in, in Buffalo. So it's, I think it's an important point because it's not just risk-based trading. I think it's the whole package. You know, I really think uh, we, we need to, we need to sit down, everyone, and, and collectively make decisions. Collectively pay, but collectively make decisions as well. Uh, which hasn't been the case to date. Thank you. So one final question, uh, Professor Moore, to finish up. In your opinion, is a pie in the sky or is it achievable that 2030 uh, we can have TB free status in Ireland? I, I, uh, I, I, I think it, uh, uh, Chair, I think it's a, a huge ask. I think it's a huge ask. If we put everything in place that I'm suggesting, uh, I, I would suggest that we would be getting close, uh, but the problem is the tail will always be very long. The tail will be long, and in fact, my Australian colleague, who I've, I've been corresponding with a lot of people prior to today, to try and understand different perspectives, he thought it was important to say that, um, for example, just to show you how draconian they eventually got, um, uh, and this is around the tail. It's not now, because we're not at the tail, but we're getting close. 
once we get to the tail is once, uh, perhaps uh, Deputy Kenny, we get to your farm, you have a breakdown close to the tail. Uh, uh, we don't muck around with test. Once we know you've got TB in your place, we depopulate immediately because we know that we could lock you up for 10 years, but the risk is there until every single animal that was present at that breakdown is still any of those until they're all dead. So basically, the, the, the issue became more draconian the closer we got. I'm not saying we're there, but, but uh, that's what we would need to do uh, in terms of 2030. And I, I think we'd be close rather than there. That would be my... I think the Penrose might have been right in the first place. There's, yeah, and your career for you. A blame and a death man, I'd be. Professor Moore, thank you, very much for your, thank, you. thank you very much for your presentation. It's very interesting and very informative. It's a discussion we'll probably be having. As you know, we've had this discussion already before Christmas, and we're going to have some of your colleagues on in a few minutes as well. So it's been a very informative discussion. Thank you very much. And, and I, I have four, four points I will come back to you. Perfect. I would appreciate that in, in, when you get an opportunity. I'll, I'll come to Josie. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're going to suspend briefly for two minutes to uh, allow the, the other witnesses to come forward. Thank you very much. Okay, I'd just like to welcome from Veterinary Ireland, Mr. Finbar Murphy, Chief Executive, Mr. Conor Gregory, uh, Food Animal Representative and Vice President, Donald Lynch, uh, Food Animal Group Past President, Jerry Neary, Food Animal Group Past President as well. Thank you for coming forward to the committee today to discuss uh, which issue, uh, the committee issues concerning bovine P TB. Uh, before we begin, I want to bring to your attention witnesses are protected by absolute privilege and respective evidence given to the committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter to qualify privilege and respect of your evidence. Your directives are only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings to be given. You are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to effect it, for a possibility you should not criticise or make charges against any person or entity by a name or situation to make him or her identifiable. Members are reminded of long time parliamentary practice to the effect that members should not comment on or criticise or make charges against either a person outside the House or an official leader by name in such ways to make him or her identifiable. Mr Murphy, I understand you are making the opening statement. When you are ready, please. Thank you. Um, I wish to thank the committee for the opportunity to meet with you today. Private veterinary practitioners, PVPs, play a centrally important role in Ireland's agri-food agri sector, our largest indigenous industry. The veterinary practitioners are the gatekeepers of animal health and welfare in Ireland. There are approximately 1,000 food animal veterinary practitioners providing services to the agri-food industry countrywide. They provide services under four key pillars, provision of services to animals in need of veterinary care, on-farm risk assessment and advisory services, animal welfare and public health. Every farmer has a relationship with a vet established over time and documented in the ER1. A recent survey by Animal Health Ireland showed that 93% of farmers were very satisfied with the scientific advice and recommendations given to them by PVPs. 
Vets are well renowned as problem solvers on the variety of on-farm situations that occur. PVPs have a proven track record in their ability to communicate with farmers, be it difficult messages or knowledge transfer. The relationship between a farmer and his or her vet is based on a long-standing trust built over many interactions, both formal and informal. The vet is in a unique position to understand the farm management systems and local relationships, geographical and personal, that can have an impact on disease management success. Livestock farmers value this resource, which is available locally in every parish in Ireland. Vets pay, play a central role in veterinary public health and food safety. Healthy animals provide quality, safe food. The vet's role in maintaining herd health and their clients' farms ensures Ireland's place as a leading exporter of high-quality, safe food. Vets are also the gatekeepers and stewards of antibiotic usage on farms and continue to drive towards relative reduction in, in use through herd health programmes, disease prevention advice, vaccination and knowledge transfer. The 200 per cent increase in vaccination use over the last decade combined with the static usage of antimicrobials despite an expanding animal population is an indicator of the vet's role in disease prevention measures on farms resulting in better public health outcomes. PVPs are a fundamental part of operating the EWAD programme on Irish farms. TB is a zoonotic disease capable of being transmitted from animals to humans, either directly or as a foodborne disease. Historically, many families in Ireland had family members suffering from TB, commonly known as consumption. Thankfully, TB in humans in Ireland is now a relatively rare occurrence, thanks to the major reduction in TB in cattle, among other measures. In addition to the human health benefits to controlling TB in cattle, a TB eradication programme is also essential to facilitate trade. Veterinary Ireland is a committed state stakeholder on the TB Stakeholder Forum, which is currently having discussions on disease control policy options to eradicate bovine TB by 2030. Achieving officially brucellosis-free status in 2009 was a major milestone and demonstrated what can be achieved when all stakeholders work together using sound scientific principles. The veterinary profession facilitated this process through implementation of the Animal Health Computer System, AHCS, on the ground in 2004. Each herd test delivers an on-farm audit of bovine animal traceability. This auditing service is provided to the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine by PVPs without financial support. The AHCS allows real-time tracing of high-risk animals, preventing further disease outbreaks in destination herds. In addition, vets provide disease management and biosecurity advice on a regular basis to farmers. This reduces the likelihood of disease outbreaks, including TB. Approximately 600 members of the veterinary profession are employed on a part-time basis by the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine, providing meat inspection services to the agri-food industry, ensuring our meat can be exported to markets all over the world. These temporary veterinary inspectors also provide surve surveillance for the TB programme and beef health check. Our members look forward to working with all stakeholders to continue the progress towards TB eradication and initiatives to achieve this goal in a timely manner. Veterinary Ireland would also like to take the opportunity to thank the Joint Committee for its interest in the significant changes made by the Veterinary Council of Ireland to the Code of Professional Conduct for Veterinary Practitioners in December 2017 and the implications of these changes for the practice of veterinary medicine in Ireland. Veterinary Ireland highlighted its concerns on this issue in its submission to the Joint Committee dated the 25th of January 2018. The effect of the changes made unilaterally by the outgoing Veterinary Council was to effectively deregulate the ownership of veterinary practice and by extension the practice of veterinary medicine. Veterinary Ireland would welcome the support of the Joint Committee in ensuring that we maintain the current high standards of veterinary practice in Ireland and that lay corporate interests are not allowed to undermine this proven system for the delivery of veterinary services to farmers and the public. This system has stood the test of time and is well regarded. At present, veterinary practitioners give 24-7, 365 day service to all parts of Ireland. Current practice is community-based with an ongoing empathy with clients and their animals. The service is provided by vets who are part of the fabric of the community. Lay corporate ownership and control of veterinary practice would have profound implications for the future provision of veterinary services in Ireland, including monopolisation by corporate bodies leading to a narrowing of competition, increased fees and a reduction in credit terms to the public. Insufficient out-of-hours cover in rural areas and significantly increased fees for the provision of these services. Vets employed by corporate bodies would be constrained to use only the drugs and services of vertically integrated corporate groups that own pharma companies, laboratories, referral hospitals and crematoria. This can compromise vets' professional discretion. Vets will be required to work to protocols established by corporate bodies to maximise returns. Investigation and treatment regimes will be dictated by management to maximise profit. This can compromise ethical standards. 
The veterinary profession in Ireland has a largely unblemished record in the provision of a first-class veterinary service to the Irish public. It also underpins a world-renowned agri-food export industry worth over €13 billion Euro annually based on high standards of animal health, welfare and food safety. This successful formula should not be endangered by the radical changes that will come about should lay corporate ownership and control of veterinary practice be permitted. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr Murphy. Uh, I'll take a question for Deputy Cahill, first of all, no, please. And Deputy Kenny. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, for, the, the, for the presentation. If it's for the presentation to us, I suppose we've had a very detailed discussion on, on TB, and um, I, I, I haven't much else to say in it. But just on, on Yone's, and I just see you know, the control program for Yone's. I personally have serious concerns on, on this control program. In this, the test, the test we talked about the TV test that, uh, earlier and leaving reactors behind you. Um, I have no, I have no confidence in the test for Yone's that, that that we have at the moment. Now I would accept that to get fa uh, a code of practice in place on the ground at farm level can greatly reduce the, the, the level of the disease. But as regards trying to, trying to control um, the number of animals we have, we to find out what even what level is in a herd. Um, you know, the test, uh, to me, the test doesn't stand up to scrutiny at all, and um, the amount of false positives you'll have with it, or the inaccuracy of testing for your is, 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 is to me, is a serious issue over to get serious about reducing, reducing the level of it. But I would accept that code of practice at farm level can, 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 can uh, improve the situation. I'd just like to, you know, the ownership of, of, of practices in veterinary medicine it is, it is a subject that we have covered here on a number of occasions in the last, in, in the, I suppose, it's 12 months ago since we discussed it. Um, I'd just like your views on where is that at the moment as regards corporate ownership? Um, you know, where, has, has, have practices um, been bought by corporate entities? And I fully agree with the Buddha points that's been made there. I don't think it will improve definitely service. It will definitely won't improve services in in the less viable areas, and it would be cherry picking of, of, of definitely cherry picking of practices are the most profitable. But I would just like to know where is that at the moment, and you know, has there was a lot of questions asked here at the time about you know whether it is legally possible for copper for for veterinary practices to go into corporate ownership, and you know where has that progressed to, and is what, what, um, you know have you comments to make as you know, suggestions as, as to what could be done, or maybe you know a, a discussion on, you know, where 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 that where, where that is at. I think that is uh, that is the one that's slipping out to me from your presentation is, you know, the corporate ownership. And um, as I said, we discussed it here. I'd say at least on three or four occasions at length. And I would just I, I would just like an update as, as, as to where uh, where it, it is on. I suppose you know, Animal Health Ireland. Definitely, you know, has has given a forum for focusing on different on different diseases, and um, the BBD eradication program. And I'm repeating myself has definitely left a, a sour taste among farmers at the time. It is taking to get rid of, of a disease which should have been fairly straightforward, and I would accept that the soft options taken um, and has definitely you know added to the length of this eradication. I think if we are going to get serious about different um, diseases, wh wh whatever they are, that we you can't you can't allow um, reactors to stay on farms when when they're clearly identified, and you know that that, that was absolutely ridiculous. The point on somatic on somatic cell count is 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 well made, and we've made huge progress on it. Just the the other thing I would just like is the use of intermediary antibiotics on farms. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk that, that that's going to be that's going to be um, severely restricted going forward. And um, you know, I would just like a view as you know, are we is our animal health is our animal health on on mastitis sufficiently advanced that we can we we can afford to reduce the the, the uh, a low usage of intramammary antibiotics or even no usage of intramammary antibiotics. And, you know, would that have a spillover on somatic cell count? And um, I suppose it has been a tool that you know farmers have used for generations at this stage, and has worked extremely, e extremely well. But you know, there is definitely a consumer, a con uh, uh, um, there's definitely a consumer reaction to the use of antibiotics at farm level, 
and you know just what what impact do you think that would have if, if the usage of intermammary antibiotics is, is, is restricted on dairy farms? Deputy, Deputy Kenny, please. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to thank you for your, your presentation as well. Uh, I suppose, first of all, just in regard to the, the TB eradication programme, maybe some of, some of the similar questions, perhaps from a, from a slightly different perspective from yourselves, being very much, I suppose, the, the foot soldiers on the ground in regard to TB eradication and what's happening there. Uh, one of the, 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 the issues is the, the average length of time for reactors to be removed from a farm. I think it's about four weeks. It seems to be quite a long time, and I'd like to get your views in respect to that. Um, also, in regard to the, 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 the issues around uh, vaccinations, what's your view on that? How do you feel that this thing of, of vaccinating the, the, the wildlife is going to work, or how can it work, or will it be a, a program that's, that's, um, that's doable, that's sensible, that can actually be, be applied in a, in, a, in a uniform fashion across the country? Uh, the, the, the presentation you mentioned about the, the huge level of work that the, the whole veterinary practitioners across the country do for, uh, for rural Ireland and for the, the farming community in general, I think that has to be acknowledged uh, from, I remember, Pat Gallagher and Mohill and Tim Mulligan and Arva and all lads like that that were, were, were characters in their own sense in rural Ireland and, and brought huge sense of... of um, uh, I suppose the, 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 there were people that, that rural Ireland depended on in difficult times and, and now they have been replaced with the more modern veterinary practices and all that, but still the same sense of, of depending on your vet. If anything goes wrong on the farm, you lift the phone and you ring the vet and they're there. There's no, there's no messing. Uh, a neighbour of mine said recently they brought the dog to the vet and the dog got more tests done in a half an hour in the vet that you'd wait three years for to get in a hospital if you went yourself for them. And it's, it's, it's that, that type of service, I think, is something that needs to be acknowledged. And I do have fears, and I, I, I share the, 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 the fears that um, have been stated by yourselves in regard to the, the, the corporate element coming into it. And we see that in other sectors where it, it, it becomes, uh, like I suppose, the pharmaceutical industry or the, sorry, the pharmacies, not the pharmaceutical industry, the pharmacies is one of them, like what we have boots and all these other chemists and chains and all of that coming into play. And I, I don't think, from the, certainly from the point of view of the, the agricultural community, it would be a positive thing. I think it would be a very negative thing if that were to go down that route, and I would support the, the, um, uh, the, the, the call you're making to ensure that it doesn't happen and that we, we maintain the type of relationship that, that people in rural Ireland has with the, the veterinary practice is something I think it's, it's absolutely essential. Um, the, other, the other work that, that continues to be done, of course, in, in, as mentioned in regard to the, in, in the factories and in the various places around the country where vets do work, I, I'd just like a little bit of a detail in regard to that. How is that contracted? How do, how do vets get those? What way does that work? How does that system work? Because I've had a few people saying, you know, they're a little bit annoyed sometimes that they, they, they don't get enough work in there as they would get normally, and they feel that it's kind of boxed off for someone, not for everyone. And, you know, I'd just like to get your views in regard to that in the various factories as to how that happens for, for some younger vets that might like to get a, a share of it that don't seem to get that, and why that is, and, and can, can you maybe throw a little bit of light on that? Um, also, in regard to and, and, and going back to the, to the TB issues, the the, um, the herds that are in the in the closed systems where they have have TB, it's known to have TB, and let they're left there to be finished and brought to the factory without being traded outside of that. I'd like to get your views on that. I'd also like to get your views in regard to the accuracy of the testing and the the. Um, the issue of, the, of the, the, the deer, which is something that more and more farmers are pointing in that direction, has been what they see as, as one, not saying the source, but certainly that they're still there, your, your, your test goes down, the reactors are taken away, a couple of months later everything is okay, but there's still deer in the vicinity, they're not taken away, they're still there. And are, are they maintaining the, 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 the infection and spreading it? Thank you, Chairman. Deputy, Deputy Thank you, Chairperson. I'd like to welcome Veterinary Ireland um, uh, here today, um, and, and thank you for taking the time, Andy, for your presentation. Um, I'd be interested in your perspective in relation to Professor Moore's uh, commentary and uh, any thoughts you might have on that in relation to the uh, efficacy of the current eradication program, um, and also the, uh, any, any thoughts that you would have in relation to his commentary in relation to the risk-based approach which he indicates 
he believes is, is required uh, and was the primary reason for the success in Australia and New Zealand. And your, your thoughts in relation to that, obviously it is something, it's, uh, it, it would be approached which would, would have great concern. Uh, any movement down that road would have great concern for the farming community, but I'd be interested in your perspective on it. Also, the question I put to Professor Moore in relation to the 30-day the pre-movement test, um, uh, your thoughts in relation to the, the, the benefits or otherwise, otherwise of that. Um, on the issue of the, uh, the, um, the issue we discussed last year um, in relation to the ownership of veterinary practices uh, and the deregulation of uh, ownership, um, just in terms of the experience in the last year as such, in terms of how that has been unfolding, um, if you could give us an update on that, please, I, I know very well, and we've discussed your concerns in relation to it, and I, I, think, I certainly think your concerns are very much are very well grounded, and something certainly we as a committee here have taken an interest in and uh, uh, continue to have an interest in. Um, and uh, finally as well, I note in your presentation you do outline how there's approximately 600 members of the veterinary profession employed by the department on a part-time basis um, in relation to uh, inspection services for uh, export. Um, and uh, I, I see that the department in the last couple of days have, have issued a call um, for private veterinary inspectors to uh, indicate their interest for carrying out uh, inspection roles at, at, at airports and ports in the event of a hard Brexit. And um, just in relation to that, I'm wondering if there have been any consultation with yourselves by the department in advance of, of, of making that call. And I, I know initially the department back last summer had indicated their intention to employ 300 veterinary inspectors within the department themselves to meet the, to be in a, to be prepared for a hard Brexit. Um, and to meet the requirement. They later downgraded that to 116. Um, but as far as I understand at the moment, they have little to none, no contingency in place in terms of actually in-house staff. And I'd be interested in your perspective in relation to, I know the, 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 the demands in terms of, of veterinary practices and that uh, they, 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 it's already a stretched profession. And do you feel that there is the capacity there among the private sector? Um, obviously, we hope in the next week or two that the Brexit will be uh, at, a, at a minimum um, delayed, but uh, in the event of a hard Brexit, is that, does that call, in your view, have the capacity to meet the requirement and do you expect there to be the, 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 um, the uh, interest and capacity within the veterinary pr profession to actually pr supply on a private tendered basis the, uh, that, that particular call that the Department of Agriculture have put out in recent days? Thank you. Secretary, uh, if we'll go back to yourselves, uh, it's, um I, I too like, would like to, act, like to acknowledge the contribution you made to the local and rural economy from an agriculture point of view. Uh, and a follow-on question from Deputy McConnell as regards the, the call for yourselves to become part of, of I suppose, the surveillance and the borders and so on supporting the event of the Brexit situation. Uh, and the implications of that from a TB testing point of view, uh, you know, you're all obviously contracted to do te TB testing for different farmers in specific times of the year, and obviously there's a set time laid out for the whole year. Every farmer really knows at this stage now when he's going to have a TB test. Uh, how will that affect, in the event of, we'll say, two of yourselves being make, going available, and if you have to leave your practice, we'll say, for example, to go, uh, if you decide to go down that road, what effect is that going to have on the TB testing uh, issue? And generally speaking, uh, as a separate question to that, what percentage, we've heard a lot in commentary from Professor Moore, and we dealt with the matter here before Christmas as well, uh, what percentage of the vet's time is spent testing, TB testing? Uh, is, that, is that figure available? Uh, because obviously it's, in some cases it could be a full day on a farm, it could be a half day or whatever the case may be. Uh, and the, vet, the vet's job is a busy job anyway, uh, without having to allow for that particular uh, situation. So the point I'm making is in the event of this, this uh, TB free status arriving, and I know what the, some of the smiles in your faces, by the way, in the audience when I asked the question earlier on, 2030 and this target uh, of achieve, being achieving that free uh, status by 2030. In the event of that day arriving, how much extra free time are you going to have? And what are you going to do with the time, free time when you have it? And is, is, I'll ask you the same question, I suppose, as well. Is it achievable in your opinion? So when you're ready. Um, I'll take the TB questions anyway. Um, I might drift into Yone's as well, Deputy Cahill. So, um, 
With regard to TB, I suppose I'll start off the, with the way the questions came, Deputy Kenny. The average length of time on farm is, is average of four weeks. Uh, my understanding is that that is because of valuation. So the, if there's more than one reactor, the farmers uh, have the right to have it live valued um, by an independent valuer and has the right of appeal. So I, I think that accounts for some of that time. Um, Deputy Cahill might uh, come be able to account for some of the other other delays that uh, you know the department can appeal the, the the valuation as well. But once the once the test is read on on the 72 hours, we have 48 to 72 hours to upload it onto the system. So that that time frame is there uh, and it's in our contract. If we stray outside that, it goes down as a black mark against us, and we have increased inspection levels as a result. <coughs> Um, the question on vaccination of badgers and whether it will work. Um, the studies that we've seen, which have come through uh, Simon's uh, research and other researchers in Ireland, basically um, led by the department and UCD, um, suggest that it is, it is as good as culling. Um, so therefore, that's why they intend to use it instead of culling. Uh, we haven't seen, we haven't conducted obviously any research ourselves, but we have to look at the peer-reviewed science and try and use that as a guide to what's scientifically correct. Um, the issue of feedlots then, um, some farms um, have restricted status, so they do not have to, they don't have, to have multiple tests if they, if they, if they have uh, reactors. Um, these farms generally are farms that finish a lot of cattle indoors. They might have grazing. Uh, it's my understanding they're not allowed to have breeding herds. Uh, they must have biosecure fencing, which means three metre um, electric fencing from the boundary. Um, your observations about wildlife not respecting those boundaries are of course valid, uh, and we haven't seen any research whether uh, neighbours of, we, haven't, we aren't aware of any research, and I think Professor Moore mentioned that that research was just uh, starting. Um, with regard to the accuracy of the testing, I suppose, as Professor Moore stated, there's no test 100% accurate. So tests are basically judged on, on sensitivity, which is the ability to pick up infected animals, and specificity, which essentially is the ability not to take out false positives. So the, the skin test, which is used um, worldwide, is highly specific. So only about two animals per thousand are false positives. In other words, show up as a reactor, but don't have TB. Um, so that's, that's, that's quite important. The sensitivity then is uh, less depending on the studies you read. It can vary from the low 50% up, up to 90%. And I think that those variations account for animals at different stages of the disease. So as Professor Moore mentioned earlier on, very early in the infected stage, it isn't as good as it is when an animal is heavily infected. And then as they progress into the um, the old, we we'll said, the, the cow that ends up um, getting thin or a clinical TB, once her immune system gets affected by the disease, then obviously it hasn't the, the same uh, ability to respond. So basically the, the reactor lump that you see on the animal's neck is an immune response. So once the animal's immune system is reduced, then the, the ability of the test. Uh, and, and of course there are other factors, uh, depending on in, individual cows and um, you know, level of infection, other disease states there that might affect immunity. Um, but the test is, it is quite good at, while at individual animals, it is, it, it is, quite, it, it is limited down to maybe 70 odd percent of uh, finding infected animals. Finding an infected herd is different than finding an infected animal. So over your average herd of 70 cattle, if there's TB in the herd, it will identify that the herd is infected while it might identify that all the animals within the herd that are infected. So, you know, animal testing varies between um, individual animal testing and herd testing. So the TB test, the annual screen that we do is a herd test. It's looking primarily to identify which herds are infected, and then the department would come in with the interferon gamma testing and try and identify more individuals that are, that are infected within the herd. The interferon gamma test then, which is a blood test, is, has a higher sensitivity, so it will find more infected animals within the herd, but it has lower specificity, which means you can have up to 10% uh, false positives. So as a screening test, it will take out a lot more false positives than the skin test. Um, 
And then when you get to the factory, people think the factory is the definitive test. It's actually only about 33% sensitive because, again, it takes time from infected to actually develop a lesion that's visual to the naked eye in a gland. You know, so you're not talking about testing the glands, you're talking about uh, a vet cutting the glands and seeing is there an actual lesion there. So that's actually the least sensitive test. So some of these false positives that you mentioned during Professor Moore's presentation are simply that they're too early in the disease to have formed a lesion or that the lesion is too small to be seen with the naked eye. Um, <clears throat> um, right, so I'll go back. Deputy McConnell Oaks, um, about the efficacy of the current programme. So I suppose in, in Finbar's outline, you know, when the TB programme started, uh, there was a huge element of human health involved in it because of, of the levels of TB in the human population. As that rapidly reduced um, during the early years of the TB programme, long before my time, um, it became, you know, com it became about as much about trade as anything else. So once we joined the EU, there, there are guidelines there that we, that we must have a certain level of TB control to trade with our European partners. And then for third countries, they obviously have their own TB testing requirements. Um, the notion of eradication, as Professor Moore rightly commented on, is only possible once you get the, the reproductive um, ratio below one. And I think as vets, we have known for many years that it's very difficult to get the reproductive ratio below one, you know, with all the external factors, movements of cattle, um, fragmentation of farms, um, herd mixing, um, wildlife, deer, uh, etc. Yeah. Can I add in that, yeah. Just ask, when you say reproductive ratio uh, below one, what exactly does the reproductive ratio mean? I mean, uh, okay, so if you have an infected animal, so we we'll say, well. We convert it to humans. If if I have the flu or a cold and I come in here and I give the I, I give the virus to more than one person, then that virus is going to spread. If I give it to less than one person, then it's not going to spread. Um, so it, you know, basically, it's a it's a how okay. it's an epidemiological. Um, so I mean, at the moment we have a very very good control program. I mean, the, in 2004 they introduced the animal health computer system. And what that allowed us to do, or the department to do, was number one, full traceability of all animals. Second of all, it allows a much faster tracing of animals that were, that were sold from an infected herd, uh, you know, that they can forward trace those, test them before they get a chance to spread the disease in that herd, and back tracing factory lesions, etc. So what, it, it, it all ties in with the aim and the, and, the, and the tagging. But the animal health computer system is the the glue that binds it all, as well as at each hair test, we uh, active, actively manage any discrepancies on the system and fix them. It's part of our contract to fix these discrepancies or account for discrepancies on the system uh, in real time before the test is reported within 72 hours. So um, that has allowed us to bring our level. If you look at the, during the, the years from 2004 to 2014, there was a fairly significant progress, which has allowed us to be in the situation now where we're talking about eradication. Now, it is an unfortunate thing that it was called an eradication program all those years ago because it didn't really have the ability to be an eradication program until now, until we're at the level that we're at. Um, the question you asked about whether the pro current program is capable of eradicating TB, I would concur with Professor Moore that at the moment, uh, if we do everything we're doing now, we will eradicate it. But the science uh, has indicated to us that it will probably be 2060 or 2070 before that happens. Um, so the question is then, do you ramp up the program in order to uh, achieve eradication faster? And if you do, uh, what, what are the ramifications? So as, as vets, which are primarily we're scientists, yes, it makes perfect sense to ramp up the program to try and get rid of disease faster. But uh, when you talk to other stakeholders around the table, you realise there's a cost-benefit um, element to this. And, and the question is, who, who's going to pay the costs? And there's going to be severe restrictions on certain farms, and are they going to be compensated? And those representative bodies will have their own say on that. So I sit on behalf of Veterinary Ireland on the TV forum, and we've discussed these. And like these uh, risk-based trading, herd classification, things like that have been severely resisted by farm organisations in general. 
because of there is no clear path of how farmers are going to be compensated for the immediate loss that they're going to suffer if uh, those restrictions are brought in. Um, for ourselves, I mean, it makes sense to try and contain disease where it is and then try and eradicate it. Um, but to bring it from 1.16 uh, reproductive rate to just under one, you know, it is, you'd probably want to see it actually working better in practice before you'd go down that path. And I, I think we haven't seen the cost benefit analysis yet. I think there's an independent study being commissioned by the forum to see about cost sharing on this sort of stuff. Um, <clears throat> Your second point then was about the risk-based approach, um, and I think the risk-based approach makes sense. And if we go back to our original um, um, line about the difference in testing animals and testing herds, you know, once you have an infected herd, rather than saying we're leaving animals in an, in, in a herd, you know, undetected because the test is imperfect, I think it's important to realise that the herd is infected, then it's de-restricted, but it's still higher risk. So if we treat it on a herd basis then we have a better chance of taking steps, especially with chronic TB herds, um, of maybe doing something else there, biosecurity, and it's in the recommendations from the forum, uh, biosecurity advice for farmers, you know, for, for those herds, and also the, the use of the pre-movement test, which would help in those isolated cases of chronic TB herds or recently infected herds, try and prevent the, the spread of TB from those herds into the 97% of herds that don't have TB. Um, and then the Chair's final question on TB was um, to do with the time spent testing. Um, I suppose we're talking about average figures here. Um, you know, there's 7 million tests done in Ireland, there's approximately 1,000 vets, so that's 7,000 um, cattle per annum. Um, there's about 100,000 odd herds, I know there's a little bit more, there's, that's about 100 herds. Per vet. So that's two herds of 70 per week per vet that's working in cattle practice. Now I know there are individual vets that do a lot more than that, and there's obviously individual vets to do less than that. Um, it was a very central part of veterinary practice for a long, num for a long period of time. Vet veterinary practices over the last two decades have you know, diversified and expanded um, into companion animals, um, retail sales, herd health advice some for, uh, vets doing factory work. So uh, it, is, it is relatively um, a lesser importance uh, to, to veterinary practice than it was. It's still a very important part of veterinary practice. Uh, and if you look at the costings there from the department papers, uh, you know, you're talking about a third of the veterinary jobs, you know, financially could be affected by, by that, which, w which would, would reduce service. The main issue the large animal practice has in Ireland with regard to TB testing is that it fills the quieter times of the year because we're a seasonal calving and lambing country, unlike our European colleagues who, who have year-round systems. So we need a lot of vets for, you know, from now until the 1st of May and maybe again um, in November, December. But for the rest of the year, you know, there isn't a lot to do. So that is the main issue in Ireland, essentially, if you hadn't TB testing and TBI work. Um, and finally, Deputy Cahill, just to, about the ONAs. Again, <clears throat> the test for ONAs, sensitivity-wise, uh, its ability to find positive animals is much lower than our TB skin test. That's widely known. Um, as regards false positives, it is quite high. Um, it's, it's in the high 90%. So, um, again, for when, when we're testing for yones, over a period of five years, you're looking to find an infected herd rather than infected animals. Uh, then once you have determined which herds are infected, you concentrate through management in reducing infection in those herds with the, the VRAMP or the Veterinary Risk Management um, and Action Plan. And in, in negative herds, you concentrate on trying to give them best advice on trying to prevent them from becoming infected by buying in the, um, the organism. It's a very difficult disease to manage once it's in. Um, in 2005, we estimated approximately 18% of, of Irish herds uh, were infected with Yonis disease. From our initial um, figures from the pilot program uh, that AHI did um, over the last five years, we're talking about 27% now, so it is expanding. 
Um, the programme that's there at the moment is quite good at determining or at helping individual farmers uh, with infected herds to, to contain it within their herds. The problem that we would have with it as a programme is we feel there is a threshold over which you go that it will be impossible to, 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 to reduce the level of yonase in Irish herds down to negligible over a 10 to 20 year period. And because of the, and, and from the 18% to the 27%, you know, a lot of that can be accounted for by dairy expansions. You have a lot of movement, you have a lot of trade. Uh, we believe that there, the time is now to take the hard decisions. Um, a study from Chagas a couple of years ago for AHI determined that a programme that would work and that would deliver um, uh, the, the, the action that was needed to, for, for, uh, to reduce yonis in the national herd uh, would cost probably about 13 million euros a year. Um, unfortunately, we have less than a million euros a year allocated. So the programme that we have, while it's good for individual farms that are infected, on a national prevalence we would have concerns um, while we support the programme, because any reduction in yonis is good, that it may not reduce the national prevalence and may miss that threshold time opportunity that we have at the moment. I'll let some of the other guys answer the other questions. I think you said there that it was, the test was about 70% accurate approximately. Yeah, so so if, if in that case, you, you say, I'm just thinking in from the point of view of the suckler farm, it's probably an average of about 15 cows to 18 cows. Mm. So it's a small number. So if, you're, if the, the test isn't as, as, as accurate as we'd like it to be, when you have smaller numbers in the herd, does that mean that you have more possibility of herds not being identified? Does that, is that, do, you, do you understand what I mean? Is that the difficulty? Like you mentioned that you know, a herd of 70 cows fair enough, you're, the chances are if there's anything there you're, go, you're going to catch it or if you, if you miss one you'll get the next one. But certainly when you're talking about smaller herds, would that have, have an impact on uh, the, the, the missing that you'd be hitting across? Yeah, that's a good so question. Areas? So the variation really occurs with the time of disease. So very early on in the disease, you, you might miss all of them. But then when you come back, you're following test, you know, those animals are still there. And that's when you see the disease showing up because it's, it's, it's further on. So if, you, if you're unlucky enough just to hit it earlier on in, 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 in the disease uh, outbreak, you may miss some, some animals. But then um, as, as, as time goes on, it'll become more apparent. Now, the other thing is that animals don't all get infected at the same time. You know, so if you look at those maps where they have arrows, so one animal gets infected, it'll infect one more, then one more. So there's a time span. So generally what happens is that it's, it's highly effective at identifying infected herds, but for the individual animals within the herd, that's why when you go back to do the retest, you might take out two or three more, you know, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Right, okay. I, I'll speak a little bit on TV, but mostly on incorporation of practices on TV. Um, at the present moment, we would be pretty sure that there are four practices in Ireland purchased by two British corporates, two each. There's also very strong anecdotal evidence that many more, possibly between 40 and 100 practices, have been assessed and would be at what's called a pre-purchase stage. The Veterinary Council issued a statement on ownership that anybody could own a practice it subsequently put it under review and then it deleted it from the Code of Conduct pending further discussion. Now, it's just a matter of interest yesterday. I, I did the survey. They have actually, they've, we did a survey of our own members and found that roughly 86% of our members do not, do not want a lay incorporation of involved in veterinary practices. Young vets who are by the proponents of people who, who wanted lay and, corpor lay and corpus to be involved in practice made the case that young vets would benefit hugely from CPD, better working conditions, better relations. There was a debate had in Mullingar and those young vets who have their own progressive veterinary network voted by 86% that they didn't want lay and corporation of veterinary practices. The Veterinary Council are present resurveying our surveys 
Now, they have also consulted with other, belatedly consulted with other stakeholders, and I think the general gist is roughly around the 80 per cent, 85 per cent, by all parties who submitted rejecting proposals for lay incorporation. Now, I did their survey yesterday. Uh, it's been carried out by an independent company, and uh, I was amazed at the structure of the questions they were asking. They asked, the first significant question they asked was, was I opposed to lay ownership of it, or corporate ownership of veterinary practices? And I didn't really know how to answer it, so I said no. And then it asked me, the next question asked me, why are you opposed to lay ownership stroke operation of veterinary practice? It's a completely different question. Ownership is one thing. Ownership and operation is completely different. So, whilst the case can be made that ownership of veterinary practice, the, 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 the legal legalities around ownership are very strong, and uh, our legal advice would be that you'd have to put up a fairly ebullient case to convince anybody that you can't own what you want to own. But what's very, very clear is that lay corporate bodies cannot, under the Veterinary Practice Act 2005, cannot operate veterinary practices. They can't prescribe drugs. It would be doubtful if they can have any input into management. They can't, by section 55.8, I think it is, they can't invoice. And nor can a drug company supply the drugs to a limited company, a limited layer corporate body. So the ideal solution, the, 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 the main, probably the main two points would be made by the protagonists of lay incorporation is one, that young vets would like it, and that has been absolutely flattened. And the second one was investment, the capacity of these vulture funds to invest large amounts of money in infrastructure and in better conditions. Now, uh, I think those can be achieved within the present structure by ultimately giving corporate status to existing practices that are vet-owned. I think that is, if there's an ideal solution to emerge from all this at the, when, all, when all has settled down, I would hope that we have the sense for all the reasons that we enumerated in our report, and some of which have been validated even recently, I'm sure you're aware of costings for night services and things in, new, in the new systems, that the solution to this would be that, that vet vets would be given an overdue incorporation status, which is available to all other people who, who are involved in service industries like they have in corporate status. It would, it would allow practices to be able to salvage, harvest some money, I'm sure farmers understand this, to invest in their practices. And we'll be able to provide those types of things like MRI, CT scans and advanced equipment, which possibly, if a, if a corporate body was going well, they would be able to supply. So... I just don't understand a few of the things you said there. Like, at the moment, bits, a group of bits is together and they form a partnership and they have a company. And you say the copper body can't issue an invoice. But like when you get a bill from your bit at the moment, mm. it's coming from the company. So how, I just don't understand how you can say that if the ownership, like I get my bill from my bits and it comes from well, mm. the name of the company and it comes. Yeah. And it comes and obviously the girl in the office puts the bill together and it comes out. Yeah. Like, if the ownership was in someone else, it wouldn't be the same thing. If, if some person in England owned it, and they just said, would well, the invoice just come out the same way? The, the problem with lay ownership and lay, lay in corporates is a, problem, is a problem of governance, in that if you have a corporate body in which you have vets only, the owners, they are all answerable to the Veterinary Council and ethically bound to the Veterinary Council. Now, in the legal advice we got, one of the stark things that was pointed out to us was that the Veterinary Council actually issued an edict on ownership being allowed to anybody without putting any structures in place, at least whereby 
lay people could be answerable to somebody for how they would run a veterinary practice. This is the, fundam the fundamental problem is that lay corporates are, are, have no, would have no governance whatsoever, no, no disciplinary procedures that are, that are both ethically and legally placed on vets. This is the fundamental problem we would see between lay and corporation and veterinary and corporation. Yeah, I understand now, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, sorry, no, sorry for stopping in your tracks. Yeah, no, you're fine, you're fine. No, it's a very, a very important point. It's the, it's the, re, it's the real point is that, that the, the ethics, like we are bound by ethics to treat animals even if we're not paid. Do you know what I mean? We don't, we don't, we do a lot of voluntary work, we do a lot of work, wildlife coming into us, things like that. That there is, there's an ethical obligation on us to do it, not to leave any animal suffer, but there may be no financial reward for doing it. Now, that's finished with the incorporation, I think. Yes, I think. Yeah. Down to factory shifts, you were saying how they're distributed. There was always an open panel system. You know, every young, young vet in the country, including myself when I was young, uh, in Willie's days, we were on the same age, uh, every young vet got on a panel. Uh, it was a very open system, it was a very good system. And then unilaterally, in 2012, the department, as part of a public service embargo, we would have to assume, decided that they were closing the panels, right? Now, until such time as we reached agreement with them only two or three weeks ago, that embargo remained. Now, I'd say the reopening of the panels will occur for young vets on an as-needs basis. And I think that the reason for the as-needs basis rather than the open policy is uh, the zero-hour legislation that's going to come in, that anybody that's on a panel heretofore, they just went on the panel, they took their one shift a year, one shift a month, and then as people left the panel, they gradually moved up the panel until such time as they got, I told some lads are 20 years on a panel before they get a permanent shift. But that system it will not, it, the panels will be opened again, but not to the extent to where they're wide open because of zero-hour legislation, which would require that if they got no work, they'd have to be paid some money. So it, it, there will be, but the, but the stasis on the panels for the last, from 2012 to 2019, was as a result of that embargo. And it, it was largely public service embargo. Now, as regards, I'll just make a few comments from, from, from an age perspective on, on, on the TV scheme. Um, we, I think sometimes we forget the progress that's been made. Connor referred to it being a, 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 a human problem. It was also like, I remember once very early in life, there was an old man spoke to me up in Kilbegnet Craigs and he said to me, he said, people really don't understand the progress that's been made with the TB eradication, well, it probably never should have been called eradication scheme, but the TB testing scheme, in that his job in the early 50s, he used to go around with, he was one of the few people in the parish who had a shotgun, and he'd go to the, the neighbours' places and they'd shoot the cows who were got emaciated and coughing blood. So sometimes I think when we're talking about the eradication of TB, We've never seen it, except for a non-carrier case, we've never seen TB as it existed in cattle, where it was a debilitating disease of, of huge economic significance, and where milk, where those animals were infecting other animals, and where the milk was also infecting people. So I think we should always be careful that we don't, as, in, as Deputy Cattle referred to with the brucellosis scheme, you don't forget where you came from, like, because at one stage we had the brucellosis almost eradicated, and when we reached OBF status, somebody, we reached OB, statistically reached OBF free status, we, we, we stopped testing, and it came at the same time as there was a massive influx of southern cattle into the west for new beef incentives and all that, and we absolutely blew brucellosis back out of the water again. So we did. So there has been progress being made. Um, I'd just like to, remem to remind Deputy Cahill in relation, and just because when he was talking about it, about the risk-based assessment, to my recollection, towards the very terminal stages of the, of the brucellosis eradication scheme, there was 
uh, there was a risk-based assessment because you, for your Bruce Losses cow, as I recall it when I started testing first anyway, you had a red card, a brown card and a green card for your cow, depending on her status of brucellosis. So if you, and, and reds could only go into a red, an amber could go into an amber or a, re, or, or, or a red, and a green could go into any of them, but none of them could come forward into a green. So even at that stage, to the stages of brucellosis, they had actually only allowed movement from cleaner herds back into lesser herds, but not from higher risk herds into less risk herds. I don't remember that. Do you remember that? I do, yeah. No. yeah. Now, I remember vaccinating from the 4520, all right. Yeah, <laughs> that was a down to lumps everywhere. Mm. Um, now, there was another question put by Do Deputy McConnellogue. What was my opinion on Dr Moore's... Yeah, I think a risk-based assessment. And looking at the TB now and Dionys and all those, where tests are... I think risk-based assessments have to pay a bigger part when you have no specific tests. You know, you have to assess the risk the herd is of, of infecting something else rather than relying on specific tests to tell me that one, that one is, that one is, and the rest are fine. You really have to take a herd analysis of risk, you know. Uh, now, you mentioned the 30-day pre-movement test after six months. Now, my understanding of TB, like of tests they did way back, is that if you put TB reactors with, say, four TB reactors with four ordinary cattle, in the first year of them having TB, they're unlikely to spread it to their four colleagues, their, their three colleagues. But if you leave them the second year, then the spread occurs. In other words, the breakdown happens in the, in the ones who have it, and they become, they, they become spreaders. Now, if you, if you send that on to the six-month test, if you have a farmer who buys on a year test, and on a, a specific day, he buys, say he has his test, and he buys in an animal that's just about a year tested, and then the following, he hasn't a test till the following year. That means that the animal he bought in potentially can be two years without a test. So that has it, huge risks that it, it's, it's gone into its second year without a test. If it's bought within the first year, the day after he's had his test, and it's just that if somebody is selling it the day before their test is over, theater, theoretically, or not theoretically, practically, if he has only a herd test in a year's time, that animal is going to be two years untested. So there would be merit in, in a, in a pre-movement pre test of, of high-risk, probably high-risk animals anyway, at least. It would have benefit. Um, now, the other point I'd like to make, and I was making this point before we came in, in relation to residual animals being left in, and, and again, their potential over two years to spread TB, the single greatest godsend that has arrived, I think, for the TB testing scheme was farmer payment. Because with farmer payment, you're guaranteed a test every year. Whereas in the, in the, in the early 80s, I remember us having whole years off where, on a particular budgetary year, either 20% or 40% of the herd would be, high-risk herds would be done, and the remainder of the herds would be left untested for that year and maybe the next year 60 percent might be done and, that, and some of them left again and there was no hope you were ever going to reduce tb never mind eradicate it as long as that residual tb was around allow, allowed to reinfect but at least now when you when you have a test every year you know you, you're going to pick up tb at a mostly pre it, it's it, 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 the animal's ability to spread it uh, now, the other one, the TVI is at the ports, and how would we be able to manage that? We were consulted about, briefly about it, were we briefly? Well, no, we're told yeah. it was happening. And uh, <laughs> as regards availability, the Veterinary Council register has increased from 2,600 to 2,800 this year. Now, we are producing plenty of graduates in UCD, Trinity, Budapest, Warsaw. No, not Trinity, no. Only oh, no, sorry, only, Trinity, only, Trinity went in my second UC, year, sorry. Only UCD. Huh? Only UCD. UCD, Warsaw, all the English colleges, we have plenty of people in there, but, but the essential thing is that we have a, an increase of 200 people in the Veterinary Council registered this year, so... Look at... We've never been found wanting when a job needs to be done. I think I've covered all I want to cover there. No, I'm not... I want to go back to the Veterinary Council and the copper ownership of practice. Yeah. Where is that at? Like you said... You said that there's no, there's no corporate governance there now. So what does the Veterinary Council 
have, what actions do they intend to do? You said there's a huge number of practice under negotiations as regards sale. Yeah. You said there's four gone through. Yeah. So is do, are you going to are you going to propose that legislation be changed or uh, what's where do you stand with the veterinary council? What, what's well, we've we've made the point, Deputy Cahill. We've made the point that by our understanding that those practices are practicing outside the law and that they're, that they're not covered to practice on the Veterinary Practice Act with lay, in, lay involvement in the management and running of them. Well, uh, with respect, that's a serious statement now. It is, yeah. yeah. And well, we have put it down as a complaint to the Veterinary Council. And has the Veterinary Council done, done anything to progress that or have they given any comment to whether they agree with you or the, disagree? The, well, I think the... Sorry, uh, Deputy Cattle, the, um, the Council is undertaking an ongoing review they, as... as uh, um, Jerry alluded to earlier, they suspended the offending clause that they put in last December, then removed it in September, and, and they're continuing a review of the whole question of uh, lay ownership and control of veterinary practice. And they have consulted widely now in terms of talk to stakeholders, farmers, uh, vets, the public, and uh, I understand they will come to a conclusion on um, uh, the um, compatibility of uh, the uh, lay involvement in the, in the practice of veterinary medicine shortly following this consultative process. So, well, the sales going to be allowed to continue while this process is going on? Uh, well, um, we don't we don't know, but I mean, as as, as has been alluded to earlier, two practices um, have been bought. Sorry, sorry, no. Yeah. I'm interrupting you now, sorry. But who registers a practice? Has a practice to be registered? Uh, 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 individual veterinary practitioners uh, have to be registered with the Veterinary Council and they also have to register their practices either as under the premises accreditation scheme, either as a, a practice, a clinic or, or a hospital. And now, registered, registered with who? Registered with the Veterinary Council as well under their particular scheme now, I suppose. And the surely there's question marks, shouldn't they put a handbrake on until the question marks are resolved? Yes, I, I think that would be that would certainly be very helpful. But I mean, the review is ongoing, and they, uh, the latest they indicated to us was that they expected um, the results of that review to be available uh, towards the end of March uh, this year. So, but you could potentially have a number of sales in between, and then they say that they're not to the kind of credit them. Yeah. I'm sure I missed then. Why would you let that continue? Have, yeah. yeah, this is it. It is an issue that needs to be dealt with. Yeah. Uh, sir, go, go on, man. Sorry, go on. No, I was just going to, I was going to say that, uh, in, in theory, what you're saying is that the, the, the lay corporate can come and can buy the veterinary practice and run it, and that's what a number of them are doing, and others are seem to be preparing to do that. Mm -hmm. They're outside the, the regulations, if you like, as we can see, it's an illegal practice, as, as that's... That's your position on it. In, in theory, the way they could get around that is if you four fellas came together and went to these guys with all the money and said, look, we'll front it for you. We're, we're vets. We'll front it for you. And they could do the very same thing, except that have, that have uh, 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 qualified vets there doing the same thing. So the, the, the point I'm making is that you, 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 your, your real opposition is to the mass ownership of veterinary practices by it's 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 the it's the big the big guys taking over and pushing out the small is that really what you're coming at here or is it the no, the, the, the problem the problem we have the problem is not ownership the problem the problem is the autonomy of veterinary practitioners to practice veterinary medicine free from encumbrances either from clients or from corporate bodies or from lay people who may have an agenda that doesn't meet with our ethics it really is as simple as that. Autonomy to practice veterinary medicine in an ethically and legally correct way. Vets want to maintain that for themselves. Now, if you take a case in Germany, there was a case in, uh, in Germany recently where the German, uh, a Dutch pharmaceutical company came in and bought a Dutch pharmacy. And the, the German pharmaceutical council, or the equivalent thereof, took it to the European courts and that there was a ruling in the last four or five months stating that each individual state is entitled for if they see good reason for any particular stance they wish to take as regards human health or animal health or professional ethics that they are within the right to 
uh, for, uh, protect those provisions. Like it is something that's used. Like our, our, our legislation, the Veterinary Practice Act from the 1800s, has always protected the practice of veterinary medicine from corporate bodies, lay corporate bodies, and lay persons. So it's, it's, not, it's not an issue of who owns the practice. And our legal advice would be that it doesn't really matter who owns a practice, but vets have to be able to run it independently. So therein lies the crux. Get the opportunity of a young, a young vet that practices for a while and wants what they would normally do is to proceed into, a, into taking a share in a practice as an older yeah. vet to be retiring somewhere. That's yeah. normally what yeah. will, will this inhibit the possibility of that opening for them? Is that, it'll is that finish the, it. It'll finish it. Yeah. Okay. They will all be forevermore be probably unmotivated employees of a big corporate. They won't have, like that's the one thing that bothers me. I'm retired from practice at this stage, but the one thing that bothers with me is the demotivation of the profession that will happen if this happens, apart from all the economic things, like you're paid a wage, five o'clock in the evening, you're paid X number of hours per week, and most vets, as you all know, go over and beyond five o'clock or whatever you have to do at any given time. It's your practice, it's your business, it's your client, it's your neighbour. You just get on. I've often been dressed to go to one of so the family the owner, communion the and, and the had to are mixed lab up or section EO. I remember getting blood all over me. Community, you just do it. But I'm not so sure that this motivation would remain. I'm sure it wouldn't remain. I've, I've been over and back to England and I've seen what's happened to large animal practice over there. It's, be, it's gone from being local to being regional. Like, you get, when you get the incorporation drive in, in, in England, there would some, most companies sold, bought their practice, kept the small animal part of it, got rid of the large animal part, either closed it down and left nobody there, or sold it on to some group of fellows who'd buy a big, big area, but you're, you're talking about 80 mile radiuses. You know, you're talking about herd health programs. You're talking about three hour guarantee to get to an emergency case and, astronaut, and, and fees that wouldn't, it, it, it literally has done away with sheep practice altogether because like the sort of fees that charge for lamb and or section EO during the night wouldn't justify bringing her there and Lots of practices, imaginative practices, have come to get rid of animals that are in, in distress, but not bringing them to the vet. And there are huge animal welfare issues. And like, look at all those types of practice in Ireland. I, I worked in a very, very heavily sheep populated area, and getting up at three o'clock in the morning to put back in a lamb's intestines for 15 euros is what you do. You just do it because you're a vet. But uh, I, you're talking about point to points, shows, you know, every gathering where a vet is required, free of charge. Like, it's, it's a system we're, we're very proud of. And we've seen our medical colleagues diverge away to out of our services. And I don't think I'd like to see either going down the English route of veterinary practice or our medical colleagues in Ireland where out of hours are far away. Like, our, our system of veterinary is town-based, village-based. It's continuous, as Finbar said, 24-7, 365. Mm -hmm. And I think you should protect that. Okay. Maybe if I could just comment on that. I think what Jerry's referring to there is the vet's place has been a part of the community, and it's something that has worked well for a long period of time. And like Jerry says about getting up at night time, we all do that. Connor referred to the number of hours we worked and the percentage of our time just taken up as TB testing. We all work 24 hours a day. If somebody is stuck, we won't see them stuck. And we would welcome the fact that we say the meat, meat factory work that has opened up recently in response to your, your question. We welcome that. We want to see young vets coming on board and being part of the fabric of community as they have been in the past. And that's what we'd like to see going forward. And I think that would also tie into as what Deputy Cavill referred to, the somatic cell counts and what happens with that going forward. You can't just take away antibiotics. You have to have a whole integrated management system where the vet or a small group of vets that work with a farmer, they know what's happening on the farm. They know what he's like. They know what his family situation is like. They've worked with him for years. And then the management structures that are put in place to make it possible to reduce the amount of antibiotics being used in that farm as intramammaries. That's important, but it won't happen 
as a single thing. It's all about the complete picture, managing the cow, managing the farm to reduce the antibiotics. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, gentlemen. Uh, that concludes today's meeting and uh, the meeting stands adjourned until, until, the, until the 5th of March. So we won't show you, we're not sure the time of the 5th of March. Thanks, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.